It would also help if I didn't have my microphone muted. So, hey, everybody. How's it going? I am Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website. Also help if you guys. I didn't have my microphone muted. So, hey, everybody. How's it going? Yeah, thanks I for the, uh, the heads up there. Um, yeah. How's it going? Happy Sunday. Cool, cool, cool. Background music. All right, cool. So background music. Yeah, background music's definitely playing. Uh, I'm going to lower the volume on that one just a little bit, I think. Cool. How's it going? It looks like LinkedIn streaming is not working, though. Not sure why. And it also looks like maybe Facebook is not working. And I don't know if it's my broadcast software. I might have to cancel and try it again. DevCrash, good to see you in chat. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, it looks like both Facebook and Twitch are not working. So something about the plugin in my system is not transmitting out to those platforms right now, which is unfortunate. Um, oh well. We'll go old school and just uh, just stream on Twitch. How's it going, everyone? Uh, so I'm just going to close this out for now. We never really had uh, too much interaction on those sites anyway. Um, check back in a little while. Um, someone just hit me up at the very last second of like, hey, can you look at my resume? It's like, sure. Like, here's just like a quick five second kind of thing about your resume. And they're like, okay, well, what else? And I'm like, uh, I'm streaming right now, so I'll get back to you in a little while. Zoe, good to see you in chat. Hello, hello. Um, how's the job hunt going for everybody? Uh, if you're on the job hunt. If you're not on the job hunt, that's fine, too. Um, just kind of want to check in with everyone, see how your weekend has been. I'm going to close down Slack. But I do need to keep Discord open because I started a Discord server today. Um... I'm going to see if I can figure out yeah so try this link um, click on this link this should take you over to the new tech interview guide discord server I haven't set up like a macro or anything for it yet um, I think once I get a couple of folks in here and actually using the discord a little bit then I'll probably uh, you know advertise it a little bit more but for now we'll just kind of keep it between us Although if you're watching the stream later on, go check out the link I'll put in the YouTube description. If you're on here on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, I'm really bad at marketing for myself, so you got to help me. So tell folks about it. Um, if you know people that are getting ready to start a career, job, uh, like a career hunt, job hunt, uh, if they're going to start interviewing for a tech industry job, not just development, but any kind of tech industry job, um, have them drop by the stream anytime. My hope with the Discord server is that people can ask questions there um, just have kind of general chatter maybe do some resume reviews and like upload them through discord instead of through the website um, although i may keep both i want to try and figure out a way to sync them between the two so i've got like one place to go for all the resumes and i've got one place to go for all the questions um, and so i'm gonna spend some time over the next little while trying to automate more of my streaming life a little bit um, kind of as i get settled into the new job next week um, more on that in a, in a minute. Um, but, uh, yeah, I will have, I will definitely have, uh, some automation going where like, I want to like get all these questions that I get asked anonymously and find a way to like, you know, is there, is there a way that I can just like copy and paste that somewhere that it'll just like show up, uh, in a channel that I basically set up on discord called anonymous questions. Um, and I'm just going to list everything in there anonymously kind of going forward. Obviously, if you come by the, the Twitch stream and you ask live, then obviously I'll, I'll address that. Or once I figure out why my streaming is not working to LinkedIn and Facebook, um, if you interact with me on LinkedIn and Facebook, then we'll, uh, you know, we'll do all of that stuff live in the moment. But uh, I always wanted to have a way for people to ask questions anonymously. Um, so you can whisper me, DM me uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Twitch. Like you can send me a message on any of those platforms. And I will keep your name out of the question. I'll just say, like, got a question. Here's what it is. Here's my answer, my perspective, or whatever. Um, and kind of go at it from that direction. Um, but I really want to have a way for people to feel safe about asking questions. Not everybody wants to ask questions in public, and I get that. So I want to have as many ways as possible to uh, to allow people to do that anonymously. Um, looks like some of my permissions on the server aren't right. Um, DevCrush. 
hit me up on that and let me know what you think. Um, I did lock down some of it. Um, and so there are some channels where you won't have access, um, at least to, to write things. But yeah, if there's something like blatant, like if I locked it down way too much, uh, then let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, to take feedback on that. So my first time ever setting up a Discord server. So it's very likely I've done some things wrong. Um, I've tried following like a YouTube tutorial on like, here's a bunch of like bots and whatever to handle moderation and things like that until I get enough of you around to say like, hey, RC Maniac, you'd make a really good mod. If you want to be a mod, let me know. I'll make you a mod on Discord, that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, Price server, good to see you in chat for the first time. Thanks for tweeting a reminder. So that just goes out automatically. I hit a button on my stream deck and it it uh, sends that out every time. Um, Zui says, I have a coding assessment to work on tomorrow. Awesome, awesome, which I'm nervous about. Hey, I'm not working tomorrow. You know how to find me. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, let me know if I can like coach you on getting started on it. You have 90 minutes, three part algorithm and data structure. Haven't received a link yet. Okay, cool. Algorithms are not your strong suit. Um, yeah, we can we can chat about that in the morning if you want. So, uh, Zui, contact me on LinkedIn uh, where we usually chat, and let's find a time like first thing in the morning before you get started on that. I do have a physical therapy appointment for my shoulder, but I should be back by 9:30 Mountain Time. Uh, I forget which time zone you're in, um, so that'll be like 8:30 Pacific, 11:30 Eastern. Uh, so depending on which time zone you're in. I should be home by 9.30, um, and let's chat. I'm basically open all day. So if you get to choose what time you start, hit me up. Let's have a quick chat and kind of go over, like, a game plan and, uh, you know, give you some, like, last-minute coaching tips on uh, how to get through that. Happy to help you out on that. Um, let's see what else we got. So Dev Crush says, for example, I can see the mod logs. Yeah, that's on purpose. I wanted some transparency over what the mods are doing. Um, so that's on purpose. You can't read the welcome rules. Really? That kind of defeats the purpose, huh? Um, yeah, okay. Um, if you can, if you can post in like general chatter and let me know that kind of stuff in the, in the discord, then I'll, I'll go through and I'll, I'll fix some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to like broadcast out the discord just yet. I want to like make sure I get all these permission things set properly and then, then we'll go from there. Um, just looking through chat. RC Maniac, appreciate, uh, appreciate you giving some advice to Zooey. Very, very much appreciated. Take a breath, for sure. Um, it's a little short term to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, DevCrush, I'd love any input that you can give me on uh, on the Discord side. I'd appreciate that. Um, I'm not looking to drive like a massive amount of people over to Discord, but um, a lot of us just like, you know, if you got a question and you want to like, swing by discord and drop it in there you can or dm me on discord or something like that i just i want to make as many ways possible for people to get help um and so i'm trying to think of that kind of stuff um here's oh that's right your snapshot time so you're one hour ahead of me so you start at noon okay so if you're starting at noon that's 11 no you're one hour ahead of me it'll be 11 o'clock my time so we'll have like 90 minutes from when i get home until you have to start uh provided that recruiter gets in touch with you so yeah, let's uh, let's hang out. Let's do like a coffee in the morning and just chat a little bit and um, see if we can uh, see if we can get you sorted out before you get started on that. Cool. Well, um, so yeah, I figured tonight I would go through some more backlog of questions. I have some anonymous ones that I was I was given just today as I was setting up Discord. I was hanging out on a couple of other Discord servers, and uh, some people reached out and. A lot of that was just by way of introduction of like, hey, I'm Ian, I run this tech interview guide thing, and a bunch of people like DM me right away. Um, they're like, can I ask a question? I'm like, you just did, but you can ask another one because uh, that's the kind of humor that I enjoy. Um, and so yeah, a bunch of people reached out. And then uh, I've also had some other people ask about resume reviews and things like that. So I just want to point everybody to like Discord and be like, you know what, just put it here. Um, my big thing that I'd really like to do on Discord is make sure that everybody's conversations are threaded. It makes it so much easier to find things like, here's my resume and have a threaded conversation under it. Or, you know, here's my question about interview prep and then thread all the discussion under it. 
it makes it a lot easier for other people to find those questions and see uh, you know other answers and stuff like that so thinking of it like a little bit like reddit in that sense where like every topic is its own sort of thread of conversation so that's kind of what i'm hoping for um i know that's really hard to sort of uh you know moderate and, and force people to do but we'll see how it goes um but yeah i wanted to kind of follow up a little bit on my own job hunt and talk a little bit about how all that ended up because it has ended I've narrowed down all of my job offers to two job offers and I'm hoping, so I negotiated on one. The other one I didn't need to negotiate. The salary was ridiculous already. Um, and uh, so I'm, I tried negotiating the other one and they're supposed to be getting me a revised uh, job offer, hopefully tomorrow. I really hope it's gonna be in tomorrow. Um, they basically sent it on Thursday, Wednesday? Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday. I forget. I think, I think Thursday. I will go back and check. My call log is on the 19th. Um, so whatever day the 19th was. And then um, I basically negotiated for more salary, more equity. And they basically wrote back and said, oh, the, the HR person that sent you the offer is actually out sick. And I'm like, well, they just sent it to me. So like, why are they, you know, sending me a job offer when they're sick? Um, but then they couldn't reply to my questions. So I got my other recruiter on the phone. We chatted and we negotiated a little bit on the phone. And uh, so this was Thursday, yeah. And then Friday I reached out and I'm like, hey, like any chance on getting that revised job offer because I got this other one that's expiring on Monday. And uh, I ended up asking that other company that was expiring on Monday if I could have a couple of extra days just because I want to be able to compare like the actual written job offers. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, but then the, the recruiter I said, I spoke with that I've been kind of talking with all along, they basically said, well, our head of HR is in a strategy meeting all day Friday. So we're probably not gonna get it to you Friday. And I'm like, all right, I'll wait. So I reached out on Saturday going, any ETA? Like, I know it's the weekend. And they're like, yeah, we're hoping Monday, but we don't know. I'm like, okay. Hey, but don't forget to turn that light off. Thank you. Um, energy conservation. It's for everybody. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to share a little bit more about, uh, kind of my job hunt and I basically went through and I put everything on a giant spreadsheet. Um, so I thought I'd share that a little bit tonight, not, not for like showing off, but like just how my brain works as far as like tracking information and things like that. Cause I also want to dive in and I'm, I'm debating writing up some blog posts about the statistics of like how many, like size of the company versus the number of interview steps I was gonna go through or went through, uh, the amount of preparation time that went into it, the average number of calls, like which, which interviews needed the most hours of interview time to get an offer, which ones needed the least amount of time to get an offer. Uh, things like that, because I think those kinds of stats are, are pretty cool. I love diving in on, on that kind of stuff. Um, can you do threads in Discord? Yeah, you can. Uh, 19th was Wednesday. Cool. Thanks for looking that up. Um, how long was I interviewing for? Price server. That's a great question. So um, this job hunt, uh, my very first interview was October 27th. Um, so I interviewed with three companies in October. Uh, one of them was New Relic, one of them was Amazon, and one of them was um, interviewing.io. No, there's a fourth one. Who's the other one? No, it was interviewing.io. Interviewing.io, Amazon, and... Wait, I lied. There's a bunch of them in here. <laughs> um... Is there three? There were, there were four. There were four. It was Twilio and New Relic for DevRel jobs. Uh, Amazon for an AWS certification instructor to actually teach the AWS certifications. And then interviewing.io was uh, was also interviewing me. And uh, so I started tracking like all the dates of things. What I didn't track in the spreadsheet was when I applied to the company and how long it took between the application and getting that first phone call. Because again, I think that those kinds of statistics are kind of neat to see. So I want to be a little bit transparent about it. Um, so let's uh, let's share that for a little bit. 
if that's cool with everybody. <laughs> so here's my spreadsheet. So I kind of went through and I like listed them all off and then I kind of went through and labeled them like company nine, company 26, blah, blah, blah. Um, partly to hide, you know, who I actually got offers from and, you know, which ones I'm still debating on and, and stuff like that. But this is basically the spreadsheet that I've built up. Um, and I did kind of color code it. Apologies to people that have like uh, vision issues with uh, with different colors. But I wanted to like kind of quickly at a glance look at it and go, oh, okay, well, this was like all the steps. So uh, for example, this really light blue one up here at the very top, this was interviewing.io. I don't mind saying their name. Um, they actually had a, an okay process. There were some things about their process I would definitely change. Um, like the leak code style problem. So you've heard me talk on the stream before about, oh yeah, I did this leak code problem that was about latitude and longitude and you had to find like the nth closest positions to a target. That was actually interviewing.io, interviewing me for an engineering role. Um, and I didn't pass because I didn't memorize this math formula that apparently you're supposed to know if you do geolocation, but this company doesn't do geolocation. I would have studied that kind of thing. Anyway, they, the, and so the, the internal engineer that did the actual tech challenge with me failed me. And so I got rejected from the job. I'm like, I've been on your platform for years, giving other people interview advice. Like I've been coding, but sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and, and uh, reject me because I didn't know some esoteric math formula that this person could name. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm not bitter, but um, this is basically like all the companies. And then I logged how long the phone calls were or how long like the tech challenge was and things like that. Um, anything just that's just in white, these are jobs I applied to and I never heard back from um, where I had a referral. So this particular company, I had a referral from somebody. I applied for a senior DevRel role and I just, I never got any response at all. And so there were a handful of those. And so basically the, the first sort of phase of my interviewing, it was primarily interviewing.io, Twilio, New Relic, and Amazon. And that basically all ended here. Um, and then there was one right away that I, I withdrew because uh, they wanted me to be like the very first DevRel and they didn't really have a good idea why they even wanted DevRel. So uh, I decided not to uh, let's do that. Uh, Xtrophia, thanks for uh, hanging out with us. I'm gonna make the little blinky lights in the background. Welcome, a little golf clap for you. Appreciate you coming by. Um, yeah, it hurts to see ghosted. Yeah, even, guess what? Even senior devs get ghosted. Um, and, and some of that was like right away. I did, I did like an initial phone call with them for 15 minutes and they're like, your experience is awesome. We're totally going to move forward with you. And then I never heard back from them again. And, um, so when we had, uh, Jen Batara on the stream last fall, uh, you can follow Jen on Twitch, uh, Jen develops also on Twitter with the same handle, Jen develops. And we had Jen on here and I interviewed Jen because Jen uh, basically had seven job offers and was like working full time and lined up enough interviews to end up with seven offers. And I'm like, I got to get you on my stream to explain that because that blows my mind as an like early intermediate stage kind of developer at the time. Uh, blew my mind that she was able to like juggle that stuff. And I'm like, what's your secret? So I kind of took some some notes out of out of her book. Um, and she's like, go put a profile up on like work for a startup.com and angel list and, and stuff like that. So I put some up there and this company that ghosted me, they were part of work for a startup.com. And, uh, I called them or they called me and we got on the phone, did a 15 minute hiring screen or hiring manager screen. And they're like, we love your background. You're exactly what we want on the team. And I never heard from them again. So ghosting happens, but, uh, it only happened twice. So the other one, and well, and, and this one that ghosted, this was actually New Relic. And this was getting all the way to the end of their process. And then they're like, oh, we're doing like some team reorganization. Uh, from what I heard through the grapevine, their team got moved under a different VP. And so they put a pause on all the hiring and I got to the very end and actually heard from one of the people on their team. And they're like, I was rooting for you. Like in my mind, you were like the front runner, like, you were absolutely going to get that job. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what happened, but it's okay. Again, not bitter at all about New Relic. Amazing team. Go hang out at the Jonan show. 
Um, they're an awesome, awesome bunch of people. And I'm actually going to have a few of them on my stream at some point. Uh, we're going to do like a whole topic on like, what is DevRel? Like, I, I want to start doing more series about tech adjacent roles that are not just full time software development. We did a panel a couple of weeks back. We had Alyssa uh, Lundgren, we had her brother Tyler Lundgren, um, we had um, Norman on here, and we had a mind blank. Who else was on that stream? Um, My memory is going on me, um, but I had a bunch of people like, how did like they they all went to the same boot camp? They all went to Turing uh, as a as a coding program, and they got out and their first job was not 100% software development. And so we did a whole stream on like what are some of these other tech adjacent roles, and it uh, it was Jake um, Jake Cohen, and uh, he was doing data engineering. Alyssa got into DevOps after studying front end development. She got a DevOps job. Tyler, her brother Tyler, uh, went through the back end program and he got a job doing sales engineering. Norman went through the back end program and got a job doing uh, like quality assurance and like he's amazing at that now. Um, and so and then Jake was was doing like data engineering. And so they were all like talking about their role. And and this is something that I want to start doing more on the streams. Like let's talk about other kinds of tech jobs that you can go do that aren't 100 percent software development. There are ways that you can apply the knowledge that you get as a software developer and put that into a tech adjacent job. Um, but yeah, I want to be able to go through like some of these companies and look at like what was the average uh, sort of like phone call time and like how long did it take to actually get some of these jobs. So if we come in here and I sort the data by the company, um, I'll let you guess who this one was. It was the AWS certification trainer role. Um, we can come through here, for example, and I can highlight all these. And then down here in the corner basically says I had eight hours of phone calls, eight hours of interviews with Amazon. And we can come in here and we can see the average call was 48 minutes long. The shortest one was 13 minutes long. The longest one was a little over an hour. So like, I want to go through and I want to like pull out all these statistics because I find that kind of stuff pretty fascinating. It's like if you want to go interview at Amazon, get ready for eight hours worth of interviews. Um, and then at the end of it, <laughs> to get rejected and get zero feedback, like no feedback whatsoever. Uh, that was probably the worst part, honestly, is you put a ton of time, ton of effort, ton of study into it, and then you just never hear back from them, so, or you don't, you don't find out why. Anyway, um, why? <laughs> Zextrophia asks in chat, why don't I work at Facebook or Google? Not good enough. Um, I've applied there in the past, and well, I've applied at Google and Yahoo and and uh, Amazon, obviously. Um, I I have applied to some. The longer I've been in my career, I've been doing this for almost 26 years now. The longer I've been in my career, the more I don't want to work for a gigantic company like that. I just don't want to. Um, that's why most of my career I've been mostly working in small startups because I want to know that my effort has like immediate impact and that I can have like direct impact on customers and the product and what we're doing and help with things like architecture where I know that I'm involved in a lot of things and I know that I'm making an impact. You go work at a fang company, you're going to be one of like literally 75,000 developers. Um, you know, and who's to say that your project's even going to like live for a long time out there? Um, there's no, there's no guarantee. Welcome to Spain. Well, hello, everybody in Spain. What's the population of Spain? Population of Spain. So hello to the 47 million people in Spain. Uh, appreciate the follow. Keep some blinky lights back here. Um, appreciate the follow, Spain. That's right. Um, hola. Cool. So yeah, it's it's not that I'm not good enough. It's just the the longer I've been in my career, the more I just don't want to work there. The only reason that I applied for this role at Amazon was because it was it was teaching, and I love teaching other people, and it was going to allow me to go down like a really deep technical track, um, where I was teaching like architecture and system design and all this kind of stuff around AWS. That's really what intrigued me about the role. Um, ultimately, though, I got rejected. But if you aren't good enough from a technical point of view, you don't even get to this last, you know, loop interview thing at the end. Um, you just, you know, and that's the culture. That's five hours of behavioral questions. That's all it is. Tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time when. Five hours of that. It was intense. It was a lot. And you have to not repeat yourself very much during that. And so technically, yes, I'm good enough to go get a job there. Culturally, apparently I wasn't Amazonian enough and that's okay. 
Um, had I gotten that job at Amazon, I wouldn't have found like any of these other really cool opportunities. So, um, but yeah, like I want to go through and I want to look at some of these other roles. Um, this one got misnumbered. Um, let me throw this down on, this will actually be like company like 28. So there ended up being 27 companies, 28 companies that I interviewed with between October and last week, 28 total companies. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of want to go through and like count like how many I actually withdrew from the process part way, how many I actually withdrew once I got an offer. Um, a couple of them I got, well, again, this one was new relic. So it wasn't that I really got ghosted. I just got left hanging at the end with no offer and no rejection either. Um, I was just told like, Hey, it's going to be a couple of months before we like resume hiring on this. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to stick around till March to maybe find out if you're going to hire again. Um, but I was pretty disappointed. I was really hoping to go work on that team. Um, they're all really, really cool people. So anyway, um, but no, Zex Trophy, I, I don't mind that kind of question at all. I love being transparent about this stuff. So yeah, ask, feel free anytime to ask those kinds of questions. I don't mind a bit. Um, Just looking back on chat here. Zoe saying, yeah, I got some lead code questions that don't make sense for the role I'm applying for. Yeah, exactly. And that's my biggest beef about lead code. Yes, it's a good indicator of how well you can do problem solving and how well you can write some code. But unless that lead code challenge is very similar to what you do as a company, you shouldn't be asking just some random lead code problem. That's where I think most companies are getting this wrong in the interview, uh, like, in the interview portion of, of the tech industry. Um, they need to knock that off. Uh, it's, it's a horrible, horrible way to, to treat people. Apparently I misnumbered like a bunch of companies. So there might've been 29 companies in here. Um, but yeah, I, I wanna go through and I wanna pull up some stats. Like this particular company, I did three and a half hours of interviews and got an offer. Well, actually technically three hours of interviews to get an offer from this company and very little like prep, uh, that kind of stuff. So I, like, I want to pull these kinds of things out um, as statistics and like do some blogging about some of that stuff. Um, but this is, this is some of the stuff that I want to kind of tinker with over the next little while. Um, also looking through chat here, Zoe says, it's interesting you mentioned that. I was told by two interviewers for the same company on separate interviews that I would make a great scrum master. Interesting. There were a couple of roles in here where I got moved to a different team. Uh, one of them was Twilio, and the only reason they moved me to another team is because the original job that I applied for, while I was going through the process, they're like, we like this guy enough, but we filled that other role, and so we like Ian enough, we're going to move him to a different team and and continue the process, and, uh, and, and that's where I dropped the ball. I messed up the interview, and so I got rejected from that job, but it was entirely my fault. Um, there was another company that I got an offer from. Uh, they will be down towards the end. Uh, it's this one in blue. And basically, no, sorry, not that one. Um, that one I got rejected. That was uh, DigitalOcean the last second. They uh, they told me I didn't have enough experience for the team they wanted me on, and they also didn't have enough like room elsewhere on DevRel. Um, but one of these other ones... Oh. It's like messing up on, okay, let me sort these by date. That's what I need to do. Data sort by date. Here we go. Um, so one of these other ones, I got an offer. Uh, senior DevRel, nope, this one. Um, so this was Datadog. And they basically, like partway through, they're like, we love all your developer relations experience, but we could really use some help on our curriculum team. And so they wanted to hire me for a curriculum developer job. And I'm like, that's cool. I know how to do that. I don't have to be like in front of a camera. I don't have to be the one giving a talk. I can like build talks, build workshops, build blog posts and let other people like go and talk about those things at conferences and so on. And there was gonna be some opportunity to go do some public speaking. Um, but at the very end of it, they're like, all right, well, here's the offer. And it was, it was a good salary. It was an okay salary. But after I got the job offer from them, they immediately posted a senior level curriculum uh, developer role. And so I reached out to the hiring manager and I'm like, hey, you know, what gives? The title you gave me is not a senior title. 
but I see that you've posted a senior job. Like, do I qualify for that senior job? And if so, is there more salary? Because they, they weren't initially going to move on salary uh, when I tried to negotiate. So I got on a call with them and they're like, well, here's the thing. We can give you the senior title because yes, you're absolutely coming in with senior level skill. We can give you the senior title, but we still can't give you a bump because you're already at the top of that, that pay band, as they call it, the salary band. They're like, you're already at the top of that. So we, we can't give you a bump if we give you the senior title. But if you work here for a year, we can promote you to a senior and give you a bump. Plus you'll have been there a year and so you get an anniversary bump. So you'll get two salary bumps plus the title. And I kind of called him on it on the, on the phone and I'm like, wait, so you're telling me that there is more money available with that title and you agree that I have the skill to get that title now. You're just refusing to give me the extra pay bump now? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Got off the phone and I wrote a, an email to the HR person. I'm like, you know, there's obviously like a disconnect going on. I'm not going to take the job. Like, I don't want to start off on the wrong foot with my manager or actually it would be my my team leads manager. Uh, I don't want to start a job and, and feel uncomfortable working with my manager around something like that. Like, you're going to bring me in, expect senior level output, not give me a senior title with the pay that I'm worth. Like, what's with that? I'm not going to go work for a company where, you know, I'm not worth what you wait. I think, or what I know that I'm worth. Um, so I withdrew and I, I rejected their offer. And it feels really weird to reject somebody's job offer. Um, this is the first time in my career where I've gone through this amount of interviews. Like this was exhausting. Mentally and emotionally, this was exhausting. Physically, not exhausting. I'm just standing at my desk or I'm sitting at my desk and, you know, I'm like, they're like, oh, check out the lights. I'm like, yeah, I wrote a Python script to make them blink. Um, and like, you know, it was, it was not a lot of physical exertion whatsoever. A lot of coffee, a lot of preparation time and study and stuff like that. So it was, it was very emotionally taxing. I would, I'm not ever going to do this kind of job hunt again. I don't like it. I've always been very strategic about my job hunt where I find a company I like and I go target that company and say, I want to go work for them and, uh, and just go do that job or go get that job. And if I don't get that job, I've studied the industry enough that I'm going to go apply to their competitor instead which is actually what got me the interview with Datadog in the first place, because Datadog and New Relic are really, really similar. And so when Datadog got me on the phone and they were like, why do you want to work here? I'm like, ah, I've actually been studying up on the observability uh, space and uh, saw this opportunity from Datadog. And they're like, sweet, all right, let's do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't mention to them that, you know, New Relic had been interviewing me. I just said, you know, I've been studying the space, you know, companies like you and New Relic. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And sometimes when when you say a competitor's name, it makes them uh, kind of think like, oh, you know, maybe we should hire Ian before, you know, he goes and gets a job at New Relic. Um, so they got me into their process. But I wanted to be kind of transparent about uh, this spreadsheet and, and, you know, talk a little bit about like the offers that I got and which ones I actually rejected and walked away from and stuff like that. So it was uh, it was pretty it was pretty interesting for sure. Um, one of the DevRel roles I turned down, it was a startup. Um, there was another one like early on in, in the whole thing where I walked away because I didn't want to be the first developer relations on the team, uh, like within a small company. I didn't want to have to like walk in every day and justify my job. This company, they knew why they needed DevRel. I wasn't going to have to justify any of that, but they also had no plan to expand the team until next January. And that was hard for me. I've worked at startups and I'm, I'm not... I'm not at all wary about like rolling on my sleeve and jumping in and doing lots of work. But to be the only person where I'm doing the strategy and the execution and all of the content and all of the talks and everything, I'm like that's a lot. If you're not going to expand the team for a year, that's a lot to put on one person per year. Their salary was good though. It was a pretty good salary. Um, and it and it would have turned into like a lead position, maybe manager role like down the down the line. So Anyway, but I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the only one for that long. Like it's, it's not a, not a good balance for me because I'm a raging workaholic. Like I, I, I seriously, I slip into workaholism like really, really easily. Um, I don't talk too much about it on the stream. I don't talk too much about it in the work life, but it is something that I'm aware of. Um, and it's just, 
not something I want to I want to do. I want to make sure that I've got a good balance of life and work and doing what's going to make me happy. Um, and that's how I've been kind of deciding on these offers that I got. So anyhow, uh, let's go back to chat here. Spain says the worst is when the company gives you homework. It's basically a project you have to code for free. Seek out skills. I mean, the, the the reality though is there is there is some amount of hey, we really need you to demonstrate that you can do the job. Like that's going to happen no matter what because we don't have like the idea of licensing and licensure and, and things like that in our industry that says you've taken this, therefore you know how to do this like always because our industry is also ever changing. It's not like, you know, you go study to become a plumber and you learn everything about plumbing. And aside from like the occasional, like new technology that would come out to help with plumbing, like once you know plumbing, you know plumbing. Once you know, you know how to be an electrician, you know how to be an electrician. Like you just show somebody your, your license and it's like you're a licensed electrician, you're a licensed plumber, you're a licensed whatever. You can go do that job because they know that you're licensed. They can trust that. In our industry, though, we don't have an equivalent. There's so many different kinds of schools out there, so many different ways that you can learn technology. You know, I, I effectively learned computer engineering, which is like low level circuitry, like IoT kind of stuff. And that was 26 years ago. Everything else I've learned since then has been entirely self taught, except for like a couple of little certification courses and, and stuff over the years. But I'm otherwise like completely self taught. And so we have to demonstrate can you do the job? Now, I was also given some take home work from some of these companies. In fact, one of the companies that made me an offer, they're like, hey, we want you to go do like this three or four hours of work. And I'm like, how about no? Um, because they wanted to see me like get involved in working with community. And I'm like, I got this whole community right here, this tech interview guide, like go check out my stream, go come hang out on my stream at any time. You can go watch all the old videos. They're all on YouTube. Um, you know, here's me hanging out on Cora. Here's me hanging out on Stack Overflow, like actually giving them links to my profile so they can actually go see how I engage with community. And they called back and they're like, okay, that's that's fine. Because they saw that I put that work in. They, like they could actually go see me doing that thing. Maybe not for their customers, but I was able to demonstrate like I have that skill. Part of it was that this company was amazing about, hey, we want you to like, uh, you know, go hang out with our community and whatever. Um, and, and just being realistic about, Hey, you know what? I really like your product. That's why I applied for this job. I used to teach about your product when I was a teacher, like that's why I want to work there. Um, and it's, so again, it makes for a really compelling story. And that's something that I talk about a lot on the stream. When you're writing a cover letter, when you're applying for a job, if that company has an API, a library, some kind of tool, some kind of product that you can incorporate into a project or just start using and get used to the support team and get used to the people at the company by interacting with the software that they build, it makes for a completely different narrative when you go apply for that job because you're not just, you know, hi, I'm trash dev and I've got these skills. You're like, I'm trash dev. I'm a customer of yours for years. This is what I love about it. This is why I want to join the team and be a part of this thing. Completely changes that introduction. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to think about when uh, when you put it in that in that light. Um, how much prep time, price server? That's a good question. So I, I know I'm like way behind on on chat here. Um, prep time varied a lot. Um, I would usually put a good hour or two into company research and learning about the people that uh, were going to be interviewing me looking through their Git repos, looking through their Twitter feeds, seeing what kind of person they are, looking through their LinkedIn history, see what kind of education they have. And every interview I would go to, I would ask them very specific, very targeted questions. Um, and I've mentioned on the stream before, I actually have like a little digital audio recorder thing. And that's that's how I was able to get the timestamps of, of like when I was doing the calls, how long the calls were and things like that, because I audio record them all for my own use. Um, and I never broadcast those out at all. Um, but I, I do it so I can go back and listen to it myself. And one of the things that I've got on my to-do list is to actually go back through those interviews and pull out all the times where I had really interesting questions to ask them where they're like, whoa, that's a good question and catch them off guard. Like it literally catches some of them like, oh, like I need to think about that for a minute. Um, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting way to sort of like 
psychologically connect with someone else where you're not just asking the same kinds of questions. So for most of these companies, I had a couple of hours of prep time. For some of them where they wanted me to put together a presentation or put together some code, there was a lot more work. Um, like with Datadog, for example, they wanted me to deploy something on Docker to show my experience with serverless. So I put together you know, a little dad joke generator, put it into a Docker container, deployed it to Google Cloud Run, and I used Datadog for monitoring. And so every time someone pulled up a dad joke, it would show up on the dashboard. And so I made a little YouTube video about it. It was about 15 minutes long. And I sent that over to them. They're like, this is terrific. And I'm like, well, it was completely unscripted, very unpolished. And I said, that's, that's a risk that I took as a candidate for this job. Because when you give somebody a take home assignment like that, as a hiring manager, I've been there. I've given people take home assignments. You expect them to give you back like quality work. And I gave them something that I threw together in less than 16 hours. And, and so when I got on the phone with them, I'm like, I did that on purpose because I've already given you links to all of the stuff that I've got polished and like my YouTube channel and all the videos, like all my teaching, like when I taught at Turing, we video recorded that. I sent them links to those videos, send them links to the GitHub repos where I was building workshops and building projects. And like, I sent them all that stuff. I'm like, that's the polished stuff. I wanted to show you what I'm capable of doing with less than 24 hours notice where you give me an idea for a workshop and I'm going to put together a rough draft of a 15 minute like this is what we're going to go build. Here's a readme file of like the general steps that we're going to go through and then take that as a draft as a team, collaborate on that, you know, run with it, iterate on it, see what we can build. And they're like, we love that you did that as a draft mode. And so if you've got if you've got enough other background, you can sometimes get away with not doing a take-home assignment as long as you've got something else to show in this place. The other thing about this company uh, where they waived like the community uh, uh, interface that they wanted me to do, um, the other thing about them was I was like, hey, I've got these other offers. I really want to work for your company though because I taught about your product. Like this is something that I really, really enjoy. I really want to work for you. Um, and so they skipped a bunch of stuff in their process. So part of it was having the experience and having a couple of phone calls where I could genuinely show them, you know, kind of the humility that, you know, I try to present. Um, of course, now I'm in my mind, I'm like, well, are you really humble if you say you're humble? Um, but they actually mentioned like on the, uh, on the call, they're like, yeah, you check all the boxes. Like you've got the technical background, you've got the skill, you can build content, you've got humility. And I'm like, oh, it's nice to hear. Um, and so they were able to waive like a bunch of stuff. What's interesting though, is that company is the only company that asked me for references and told me they're going to do me, uh, to put me through a background check. I'm like, that's fine. I'll pass a background check. Like never been arrested, never had problems like that. Like that'd be fine. But yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting for sure. Make it, uh, caught up on chat here a little bit more. I know I sometimes go on a, on a tangent. Um, RC Maniac says it reminds me of a role I applied for. They expected a remote worker um, budgeted for that because I was too far from one of their offices. Pointed it wasn't that far. Suddenly they went, oh, we have to adjust our budget so you'd be a local worker. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of like back and forth that you can do with companies uh, around some of that stuff. Uh, RC Maniac kind of going back to my workaholic. Uh, comment earlier and said he had a friend that was a workaholic they developed an ulcer still has an effect on their health honestly like that's where I got all my gray hair like I'm turning 48 and I sometimes look like I'm 60 you know like my hair is like actually really white uh, this this light kind of dampens it down a little bit but uh, like I noticed this part of my beard is like almost completely white now I used to have really dark hair like honestly my like my whole head used to be really really dark hair um, and I worked at a startup where I was doing like 90 hours a week for 13 months straight. Uh, hated life, had a newborn uh, at the time. Didn't hate that part of life. That part was awesome. But trying to be a new dad and stuff like that, it was really, really hard um, to put in that kind of time. And when I quit that job, like literally within a year, like my hair was like going seriously gray. Um, so yeah, not, not fun. MEB, good to see you in chat. Hello, good to see you. Um, Spain says, I personally think a GitHub would be enough to showcase your skill. Yeah, I mean, some some people honestly feel that way and I don't disagree. If you can show the kind of skill that, that they're looking for, 
What's hard though is knowing exactly what kind of skill they want you to present, what kind of skill you have, what kind of skill they really need for the job, um, and having the right sort of breadth and depth of, of background to show them that. And a lot of folks that hang out here on the stream are looking for the, their first job in tech or maybe their second job in tech. There are a couple of people that drop by that are senior level, but a lot of people that come by here looking for you know questions or looking for answers to questions and, and you know talking about you know how do I handle this part of the interview and things like that. They tend to be early career, and that first job is really hard to get because you don't have like a gigantic portfolio of projects. You don't like. You know, for me, I've been in the industry for so long, I've got conference talks, I've got meetup talks, I've got slide decks I can show you, I've got all the code repos, I've got blog posts that I wrote, you know, for companies about, you know, product and teaching about product, like I've got that as a portfolio over years and years and years. But if you're just coming out of school and you're looking for an internship role or you just finished a boot camp and you're looking for that first job, you've got maybe half a dozen projects and that's it. And for some companies, that's not necessarily enough. I was actually listening to someone else's podcast today and they were talking about, um, you know, sort of how to differentiate yourself. And they're like, oh yeah, it helps when you've got all this background and whatever. I'm like, well, yeah. Like I say that too on, on my stream, like when you build a resume for a job, you want to put every project, every job, like all that stuff. You want to make a really big resume and then you want to trim it back down to your desired length, whether it's a one page or a two page resume. You want to trim it back down to that length by stripping away all the stuff that that company is not going to care about. So when you go apply for a job, you make a copy of that resume and you trim out everything that they're not going to care about. Um, and so the person that I was kind of uh, DMing a little bit just as I started the stream, they're asking me for a resume review and I was looking at it and I can, I can go look at some of it. Um, I'm not going to show it on the screen though, because they didn't anonymize it at all, but they're like, here's my resume. And they, they sent me like screenshots of, of blocks of it. And so the skills block was like Ruby, Rails, Git, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, React, C++, jQuery, Arduino, you know, listing all these things. And I'm like, cool, what kind of job are you applying for? And they're like, DevOps. I'm like, okay, because your resume reads like a software developer. Like, your resume doesn't scream I'm a DevOps person. At the end of their skill list, they had like, you know, databases, Circle CI, Docker, AWS, Azure, PowerShell, SQL Server. It's like, if you're applying for a DevOps job, all of that stuff needs to get bumped to the front of that list. You need to show them I'm a DevOps person with all this other background in some programming languages. But the primary skills that you're going to care about for the job are, you know, my, my experience in Docker, my experience in cloud architecture, my experience in deployments. My experience maybe like setting up and managing databases that's devops so i kind of wrote them back like just as i was starting the stream i'm like like you almost need to build two different resumes one for devops one for software development and then figure out what kind of job are you applying for and send them the right resume um and their question was basically well i'm applying for a job and i'm doing the first recruiter screen and they're like i love your background love your experience you're talking about it really super well let me pass you on to the hiring manager and then they never get a phone call back. I'm like, well, yeah, if I'm a hiring manager hiring for a DevOps role, your resume doesn't look like a DevOps background. Like you need to talk about more of the DevOps type of work. Like you need to promote that really heavily on the resume because they need to find that in a hurry. Uh, so yeah, when you're applying for these jobs, like you don't always have the breadth of knowledge and the depth of the knowledge, but you do need to show them what's important to them and that's what you're bringing to their team. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of customization that needs to happen there with uh, with resumes. Cool. Uh, Spain Redeemed Hydrate, appreciate that. Um, this stream is not sponsored by Hint Water. It's sponsored by me, and I happen to really like Hint Water. Uh, I got uh, watermelon mint and pineapple tonight, just to change it up. I usually have like pineapple mint and like a cranberry orange. Ran out though. This is my last uh, watermelon mint. So I had to pick up a variety pack of like just cherry and just watermelon and just pineapple. I might start mixing them together or something. Price services in chat. At least I'm not bald. Yeah. At least I'm not bald. I still got the hair. It's just a much different shade now. I call them life highlights now. Um, 
but yeah, what else is uh, what else is going on with everybody? Um, what else is going on with like is anybody in chat right now? Is anybody on the job hunt? Anybody looking for stuff? Anybody have questions? I do have a couple of anonymous questions I do want to get to, uh, and so I'm going to pull those off the Discord uh, server that I, I kind of posted in earlier. Um, but yeah, folks can uh, can check out the Discord. Let me paste that link in here again. If a couple of you want to join and just hang out, I know some of the permissions are a little wonky. I need to go back and reset some of the permissions. Um, but if you want to uh, swing by the Discord, you're welcome to um, just to join and say hi. Let me know in like any of the general channels where you can post what's not working, and I'll see if I can fix it. And if you can't even post in those channels, just DM me, and I'll go through and make sure I reset some of that stuff. So, uh, Price Server says, yes, I'm struggling to study and get into the habit of getting good with Lee code while working. Yeah, I've talked about that a bunch on the stream. Like, this job hunt I just went through, there's no way I could have done that while working full-time. There's no way. And that's why I had such a huge admiration for Jen Batara when Jen came on the stream last fall to say she was working full-time and coordinated enough interviews to get seven job offers all within a small amount of time. I'm like, how? Like, you know, I kind of get that uh, that Star Wars meme of, like, is it is it possible to learn this power? Um like just how do you juggle that much and work full time? It's it blew my mind, and so we had Jen come on the stream and she's like, yeah, I did a lot of the interviews during the day and I just made up the hours in the evening. Looking for a job really is a full time job. Like I've literally spent the last part of December and all of January just nothing but interviews, prepping for interviews, <laughs> recovering from like just the prep of the interviews and like trying to sleep in a little bit on on a couple of days. Um, because it is very taxing. It is a full-time job looking for a job. Um, and that's why I said earlier on the stream, like, I don't think I would ever do another job like this where I'm like blasting out so many resumes and so many applications at a time. I think, I think at most I had something like 14 or 15 companies on the go at the same time. So yes, total, I had like 28 companies that I applied to 28, somewhere in there, somewhere just short of 30 companies. Um, of those got rejected from a handful, I think I had like half a dozen offers and I narrowed it down to two. And so I'm making that decision hopefully tomorrow. So the job hunt is over. Both of those jobs want me to start a f the following Monday. So January 31st, I will start whichever job I pick. So pretty excited. They're both going to be amazing jobs. Um, and it's really hard to pick, honestly. And, and I was chatting with someone the other day about that too. It's like, I hate picking. Like, this is why I've never had a job hunt like this where I've done so many interviews, got a whole bunch of job offers, and started, like, telling other people, like, hey, could you hurry up? I'm sitting on some job offers. Like, I really would rather work for you. That works. I will tell you from experience, that absolutely works because I had so many other companies, like, scrambling of, like, let's get you through the process, et cetera. In, in the midst of all of this, Google reached out. They're like, hey, we got, like, this DevRel manager role. And I'm like, well, let's get on the phone. Let's talk about it. And on the phone, I'm like, well, in between scheduling that phone call and actually getting on the phone call, I had like two offers come in. So when I got on that call, I'm like, I got like, at the time I had three offers. I'm like, I got three offers. I'm expecting at least two more. Like, how quickly can we get through the Google interviews? And they're like, well, it's probably going to take two weeks. I'm like, I'm not going to have two weeks. So I actually walked away from their interview. Um, which is weird. It feels weird to like walk away from a big fan company where the pay would have been just stupid, ridiculous. But for me, it's not about the money. Um, I've worked in tech long enough. I've got the nest egg. I've done investing. Like I don't do any of this live streaming to make money. Like I don't need the money. For me, it's about enjoying what I do. The money's nice. Yes, absolutely. But for me, it's not about making the most dollars. I know for some people it is, and that's okay. If you want to chase the dollar, chase the dollar. I don't have a problem with that if that's your thing. It's not my thing. So. Cool. If there are other questions. Oh, so, yeah. So, sorry, price server. I didn't really get around to, uh, to answering your question. Um, how do you juggle? Like, struggling to study, get into the habit of getting good with Lee code, also while working. Um, it feels like I need to solve hundreds of problems, which takes months. Yes, but there's a shortcut. Um, so if you go check out my YouTube channel, I just dropped that in the chat. Uh, YouTube.com slash Ian Douglas. Um, search my videos for the word leak code. There's two videos on there I want you to watch. Um, 
one's about an hour long, the other one's about an hour and a half long, but but for both of them, like you kind of get the gist about like 45 minutes in. So you can, you know, put it on like one and a half speed or something like that to, to kind of get through them quicker. But what I talk about on those is like how to shortcut that lead code grind. And then the second one, that, that was the first one is how to shortcut the grind. And the second one is how do you reverse engineer other people's answers into pseudocode to kind of learn those strategies. And so the two videos kind of partner up uh, in that way. And I would like to go in at some point and like really polish those videos and like make them shorter because, you know, I don't think that first one needs to be an hour of content. I could probably go back and re-record them and put them both in like a single 45 minute video. Um, but I was just explaining stuff on the stream and I just put the video as is up on YouTube, but you can go back and, and watch those. Um, the idea with the, with the lead code grind is learning about the strategies at a high level and then coming up with a schedule of like, how do you schedule those different kinds of problems on a regular basis? And then from there, if you, if you, uh, get to a pattern of a problem, like I don't understand dynamic programming, um, then go find a bunch of dynamic programming problems, go find other people's answers and then reverse engineer that, those answers into pseudocode to kind of see how other people got into the mind space of how they do dynamic programming problems and then learn from them, learn from kind of their mindset of how did they tackle that kind of problem. Um, and then the other thing that you'll kind of learn over time, if you do that for the same kind of patterns of problems over and over is you'll start to pick up on, oh, when I see this kind of wording in a lead code challenge, it's probably a heat problem. If I see this kind of wording, it's probably like a backtracking problem and I can solve backtracking with breadth for search, depth for search, just plain recursion, like lots of ways of doing it. And so understanding the different sorts of pros and cons of why would I use one over the other and, and which of those strategies is gonna be the easiest to build, the easiest to optimize, like the fastest that I can actually code, like which one's the least amount of code, like all that kind of stuff. And so you'll start to learn those strategies over time. So go check out those two videos. I think those will really help you out the most. Uh, follow up then, should you spend as much time as needed to solve a problem? Or do you go up after 45 minutes and look at the solution? Um, I would say go look at the solution if you can't figure out like how to even get started. But I generally talk about a four step process, uh, which I know I've covered a lot on the stream. So if you've been on the stream recently, you've heard me talk about this process. Um, the first step is like restate the problem in your own words. And if you're on leak code, just type it out in your own words because sometimes just coming up with like a clarification of what you're expected to build can help you kind of get into the mindset of what is this problem about? How am I gonna solve it? The second step is asking clarifying questions, which is a lot easier to do if you're doing a mock interview. Uh, it's a lot harder to do when you're practicing like lead code because you're the only one doing it. Um, and so I would say if you're, if you're stuck on the idea of how do I even get started on this kind of problem, then I would, I would kind of revert to what that second video talks about where you go look at someone else's answer, turn their answer into pseudocode. And then once you compare like a bunch of different pseudocode for that problem, so like go find four or five answers, write out pseudocode for each of them, compare the pseudocode that you write so that you see different kinds of strategies, pick which one you wanna go build and then go build that. And if you can successfully build it off your own pseudocode, then you know your pseudocode process is good because then the next time you see that kind of problem, you're like, okay, well, I can kind of remember some of the pseudocode I did last time. And you know that based on how you write pseudocode that you're able to write real code against that pseudocode to actually find an answer. The key with that reverse engineering though, this is one of my favorite tips, um, is go look for answers in programming languages that you do not know. If you're a Python developer and you go look at an answer in Python, you're gonna memorize the syntax and it's about coming up with a strategy you're not going to gain as much of the strategy by memorizing the syntax. And so you have to go look at an answer in Ruby, JavaScript, C sharp, something like that, and then write out the pseudocode for what you think their code is doing, because that's going to help you get into the mindset of how do I solve this kind of problem? And then from there, go practice turning that pseudocode into real code. Um, so do you, do you cap it at a certain amount of time? Not necessarily if, if you're kind of working through that four step process. So, Restating the problem, asking questions, pseudocode, and then writing the real code. Those are the four steps. Um, once you have the pseudocode, then you go write the real code. That's step three and four. Once you get that kind of process down, if you're following that process and it's just taking a long time, that's okay too. Practice makes better. 
practice is going to make you faster at any of those four steps, restating the problem, finding questions to ask, um, you know, writing up the pseudocode, writing up the real code. You can get faster at each of those stages with a bit of practice. So I would say if it takes more than 45 minutes, that's okay. But it is an indicator of like, yeah, you kind of need to get it down to that 45 minute window because that's how much time you're going to have in a real interview. So you do need to get it down to that 45 minute window eventually. But if this is your first job in tech, they're going to care a lot more about your process and about your communication than about the quality of your code. They care that you can code and they care that your code doesn't totally look like a dumpster fire. They want your code to not be garbage, but for a lot of companies, they're going to have a mindset of done is better than perfect. If you can find any kind of solution, that's better than not solving it at all. So if you can kind of hack together a solution in 45 minutes and it works, at least I can walk out of that interview going, eh, okay, the code wasn't amazing, but we can hire them. And that's why we have senior level devs to make your code better. If you turn around and you write really awesome code and your process is really slow and you don't solve the problem, I'm going to walk out of that interview going, if I hire them, are we ever going to hit a deadline? That's my sort of mentality and, and thinking when I'm interviewing someone who doesn't solve the challenge at all is, okay, well, I can teach you the technical skills to kind of get through this stuff, but if you're always going to work this slowly, then I need to make sure that you're on like super low priority stuff or I just don't hire you because I'm worried that we're not going to hit a deadline if I hire you and put you on that project. And so it's, it's a risk that you take by not solving it at all. And so you want some kind of solution. So hopefully that'll that'll help you out with, uh, with your question there. Uh, DevCrush asked a question in chat. As a Python developer, I find certain tasks like sorting exceptionally trivial. So I never memorize any algorithms except a few except for my favorite pigeonhole. Is there value in studying tasks like that, which are only valuable for something like that in an interview? I wouldn't memorize sorting algorithms. Um, I wouldn't bother. If they if they ask you to implement merge sort or insertion sort or something, like they're, they're interviewing for the wrong thing. They're interviewing for people that have like a really good memory for really esoteric algorithms that you are never ever going to use on the job. I promise you, you will never write your own sorting algorithm on the job. You are going to use built-in sorting libraries to maybe manipulate data in a particular way while that merge sort or insertion sort or quick sort or whatever actually sorts your data. Yes, you will build your own comparators, but you're not going to invent a brand new sorting algorithm. I promise it's, it's not going to happen on the job. So, I mean, is it worth studying? You can ask the HR people like, hey, what kinds of questions are, are common, you know, that they get asked. Um, and you can ask the hiring manager, like during the hiring manager screen, like, hey, what kinds of things should I be studying? Should I bother studying things like sorting algorithms? And they'll, they'll give you some indication of like what kinds of things to study. Me personally, I wouldn't bother studying things like sorting algorithms. I think companies that ask for that kind of stuff are asking for the wrong thing. And they're, they're not going to be a good company to work for if they're asking you to memorize those kinds of things. Um, kind of goes back to what I was saying when I was showing the, the spreadsheet of my job interview, you know, where I interviewed at that one company that was asking a latitude longitude problem and they don't do anything at all about geolocation. Then why are you asking that problem? Like it's so unrelated and that person asking that question had some really weird math formula memorized not just the formula, but also the name of it. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, I don't care what it's called. I don't care what the thing is. Like, I'm like, you don't do anything with geolocation. Why are you asking me this question? Um, that's what makes it really hard as a candidate is to realize that you're being asked a question that is so unrelated to what your day job is. Um, it feels very demoralizing. So no, I wouldn't worry about memorizing that kind of stuff. I would just say like, hey, you know, I don't memorize those kinds of algorithms. I'm just going to use like sorted or dot sort or something on the data structure as is, or do a Lambda function or something and like build a new sorted, you know, dictionary or something like that. But I'm not going to bother spending my time memorizing that kind of stuff. It's, it's not a good use of time in my opinion. All right, well, let's get to uh, some other questions here. 
By the way, keep asking questions in chat. I love this. Keep it going. Happy to take questions kind of as we go. Um, I had someone reach out today and ask, uh, do I have to be very good at Express, Node, and then Django and Python in order to get a job in backend development? Um, no, but I would pick one or the other. If you're, if you're brand new in tech, I would go deeper on your knowledge, what we call depth of knowledge, than breadth of knowledge. Early in your career, it's easy to see how much you don't know. You can find these charts of like how much you think you know. And it's like, okay, I think I know all the things. And then with a little bit of experience, you're like, oh, wait, no, I don't. And, and you kind of, it's this big thing of like, I think I know everything. No, I don't. I think I know everything. No, I don't. I think I know everything. No, I don't. There's so much to learn out there. Early in your career, it's like, ooh, shiny, I'm going to go learn this. And ooh, shiny, I'm going to go learn that. And ooh, you know, this new framework looks kind of cool. And oh, now I'm going to go tinker with this language or that language. And the, the depth of knowledge that you get in that technology is so small. It's so limited that it doesn't serve you well for anything else that you're doing. Aside from like, oh yeah, if you need me to like write a to-do app in some other framework, like I can go figure that out in an afternoon. But you're not going to be building to-do list apps based on these tutorials. You're going to be building like real functional applications and you need to learn the deeper aspects of how that language works and how that framework actually operates and does things. You need the depth of knowledge more than you need the breadth of knowledge early in your career. So for this question, do I have to be really good at Node and Express and backend JavaScript and Python and Django in order to get a backend role? And I basically wrote them back and said, no, you need like one, pick one tech stack. And they're like, well, which tech stack should I use? And I'm like, well, it depends on what you want to build. Python is going to be a really good general purpose language. Django is a little bit harder if you're going to build like a full blown like web application. If you're just going to do APIs, you could do Flask. But do that. Study that, learn that, go really deep on that. If you want an easier time, you can do Ruby on Rails. There aren't as many jobs out there for Ruby on Rails, but there are jobs out there for Rails. Kind of in between that, as far as complexity and the number of jobs, yes, you could do JavaScript on the back end and learn Node.js and learn Express um, and like find an ORM and all that kind of stuff and like build out a back end API or something in JavaScript. And then JavaScript will also transfer well if you want to get into like full stack and do front end stuff as well. Um, and so I kind of put that one in the middle. So you got Python, which is easy as a language, and there's plenty of jobs, but the frameworks sometimes are a little harder. On the other end, you've got Ruby on Rails, which are both pretty easy to pick up. I hesitate to use the word easy because it's, it's subjective. It's different for everybody. But I find Rails easier to understand and the language of Ruby as easy to understand as Python. But from a framework point of view, Rails is way easier to learn than something like Django. And then in the middle, you've got JavaScript with Node.js and Express. It's my, that's my take. Whether others feel that's valid is up for, up for interpretation, but uh, that's my perspective on it at least. DevCrash says in chat, it's funny you say that. I feel like I've been lazy and learned Python to an extremely esoteric level instead of looking at new languages. And that's fine too, because the deeper you go on something, the more knowledge you have to transfer into something else if you are going to go learn something else. So if you want to take that Python knowledge and go learn Rust, Rust looks a lot like Python. So guess what? You're going to have a much easier time picking up Rust. Um, Python is also going to transfer well into Ruby. If you want to get into Ruby, it'll transfer well into C Sharp. If you want to do C Sharp, there's lots of C Sharp jobs out there too. So it really depends on what you want to build in your career and what next technology you want to go learn. Um, and so Python will actually serve you really well. The deeper you go, the more knowledge you have to transfer once you do decide on some other tech stack to go learn. Cool. Um, another anonymous question I had, how does SaaS relate to backend? I heard it makes backend developers lazy. Um, the way that they wrote SaaS was S-A-A-S, which is a common kind of like acronym for, or not, is it acronym? It's the initials for software as a service. So something like building an API. Um, I wasn't sure if they meant that or if they actually meant SaaS, S-A-S-S, -S, which is kind of like a higher level version of CSS as far as like front end development goes. So I responded to their question in, uh, in a private chat 
assuming that they meant API development. Um, and so their question was like, how does that relate to backend? And I heard it made backend developers lazy. And I'm like, it doesn't make them lazy. Knowing how to integrate someone else's API is like a core thing of what we do as backend developers, how to build APIs and how to consume other APIs. That's a lot of what we do as backend developers. Um, and so I was kind of like explaining some of that to them. So no, I don't think it makes developers lazy. I think it actually brings out the best of the internet when you can go find multiple APIs and like mash them together to do something really cool. One project that we used to do at Turing, for example, is you would have somebody enter uh, like a starting and ending location and you would hit uh, a backend API to get a road trip route between point A and point B. And then based on when you arrive, you go do a weather lookup for your destination at the time you arrive. So that it's like, okay, well, here's your road trip. It's gonna take you 10 hours. And when you get there, it's gonna be sunny or it's gonna be snowing or something like that. Um, and it was a really fun project because it mashed together a whole bunch of APIs. And, and, just, and then you had to expose that as an API. So someone else could go build a front end about it. And we would just hit your back end API where we would send you like the start and end destinations and you would give back this payload of data. Uh, it was a really fun project to do. It was one of my favorites that, that we were doing at, uh, at Turing. So no, I don't think it makes backend developers lazy at all. I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts on that. Um, DevCrush asks, what do I think, generally speaking, what do I think of GitHub Copilot? I actually like it quite a lot. It's really interesting. Um, I've, I've tinkered with it a little bit. The danger with it though, my understanding of it is that it's basically a giant machine learning engine that's looking at all of the public facing GitHub repos. So when you're typing in a comment, like I wanna do this or that, it's basically doing some machine learning interpretation of what you write as a comment. It's going out and looking for code samples that it thinks are related to that. And it just starts like pasting in chunks of code. In my experience, having played with it a little bit, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty nice. It's it's a neat little tool. I had to make sure that I had it disabled in my VS code though, when I was interviewing, because I didn't want I didn't want to like, yeah, let me restate the problem and comment and have like a big chunk of code show up. That's not what they're hiring you for. Um, and you would you would need, also need to be really careful on the job of reusing someone else's code, even if it is open source, even if it is publicly available. Um, I probably would not be using something like Copilot in a production environment on the job. Um, I might use it like in a different editor, like, like I would have like VS code on one monitor and I'd have my main IDE on another monitor where I do something like, you know, okay, over here in VS code, I'm going to like write out kind of what I think I want, have it go find some samples. And then from that, I'm not going to like copy it line for line, but it's going to help maybe inspire what I need to go build, but I'm going to write that code myself. Um, because a lot of your employment contracts are going to say like you are the one authoring this stuff and you give us a license perpetually to use your software forever. Well, if you're copying and pasting someone else's software, your company is now on the hook to follow whatever software license that, that developer put on their code. Um, one of the job offers that I got in, they explicitly said in their offer, like you will absolutely never, ever, ever use under any circumstances any software, any library, any third-party code that uses the GPL license. And I'm like, it's interesting. I'd never seen that in an employment contract or the LGPL, the lesser GPL license. They absolutely want nothing to do with GPL. I forget why. There's something about like, you have to then open source like anything you build, no matter what. So you can't use it for like um, proprietary software because if you use GPL software, you then also are forced through that copying of that license to then open source anything you do. And so because Copilot is grabbing snippets of actual code, it may have a license attached to it. And now you're forcing your company to then also be responsible to use that same license. Your company may not want to. It may be forcing them into a legal position where now they've got to like, uh, you know, publicly release software and things like that that maybe they don't want to. So no, in a, in a real job, I would not be using Copilot, but I might pull it up just to kind of get ideas of like how someone else solved that kind of thing. So similar to what we were just talking about, reverse engineering leak code problems. You can kind of do the same thing, I think, with Copilot. Just don't copy and paste the code. 
use it to kind of inspire what you want to build, but go write your own code for that, please. Don't get your company into any problems there. Um, RC Maniac asked in chat, uh, a friend looking for a new job is going through ca cracking the coding interview. Um, they were confused by questions like, can you implement three stacks with one array? Or implement the basic functionality of a queue with two stacks and no additional data structure? And wanted to know if those kinds of questions get asked in a real tech challenge. I've not seen those kinds of things asked in a real interview. Um, not in a really long time. Does it mean they're not ever asked? No. But I think a lot of a lot of companies are not looking for that level of knowledge. Depending on the kind of company though. If you're new in the industry and you're just going for like a web developer kind of job where you're doing like a little bit of front end or you're doing a little bit of full stack or you're doing a little bit of back end, you're probably not gonna get asked that kind of question. If you go for a job at a FANG company, they absolutely care about things like call stack, memory usage, and things like that. And they want to know, like, what can you do with the minimum amount of resources possible? Um, so something like that maybe could come up with, like, a FANG level company. But that would be something I don't think I would be asking, like, an entry level developer. So depending on the experience that your friend has, uh, RC Maniac, I don't, know that, I don't know that that kind of thing would come up. Um, RC Maniac says, I didn't get asked that kind of stuff. Friends at Google said no. Um, one company asked to make Minesweeper. Another said they asked how to make change with the minimum number of coins. Yeah, the, the coin change problem is just a depth first search. Um, or traditionally, it's depth first search or, or a dynamic program problem. Uh, Zui says, I've tested Copilot. I think it's fun, but I think it's more helpful for, for developers who have a better understanding of development than someone who has barely any development experience. That's true. I agree, Zui. I think using something like Copilot, where you write a comment of like, I need to like loop over a data structure and calculate averages and like, blam, like there's a bunch of code. Suddenly it's like, how do I know that this code is actually going to do what I expect it to do if you're new? So yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's novel. It's really neat to see, but I wouldn't be using it for like homework. I wouldn't be using it for production code at work. I wouldn't be doing it for any of that kind of stuff. Again, mostly from the licensing point of view, you just don't want to end up in like legal problems or other kind of stuff. Um, RC Manic says, I said the most common question I got asked was basically, you're going to get data at random. We want a result for a given time frame. That's interesting. Yeah, time time series data is, is an interesting one to try to solve. Design a class that can accept that data and give us the result that we want. Yeah. Um, yeah, like give us the most common event within the last hour. Yeah, that's 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 a much more common type of problem where you just get a stream of data and you just kind of have to keep track of the sort of category of problem as you see it and like how you build that up in a like a hash map or a dictionary or something like that. And are you tracking just a count? Are you tracking like an array of those events that happen? Um, because again, you have to kind of look at the, the amount of memory that you're using because some companies are going to care a lot more about the memory usage than they are about the CPU time. So there's a, there's a balance that we strike between kind of what we call time complexity and space complexity. And sometimes it's okay to use more memory, but not CPU. But some companies want to minimize, or they say like use as much CPU as possible, but use as little memory as possible. So that kind of goes back to the first thing that you were asking, like how do you implement a queue with only two arrays and things like that. X90, good to see you in chat. Hadn't seen you around in a while. Good to have you back. Hope you're doing well. Give some blinky lights to X. Good to see you around. Cheers. I'll make sure I stay hydrated on these things. Cool, these are all good, good questions. Um, RC Manex says, no, once you do the time series problem, the follow-up is almost always, after a few months, this will be huge. How do you how do you clean that kind of thing up? Um, one of the things that I did at a job is we actually rolled up that data on a regular basis. And so um, you start to lose, like we would purposely drop the granularity of the data and only keep track of like the event type and not necessarily all the details with it. So we could say like, you know, I'm going to keep like hourly data. And then once 24 hours passes, I'm going to roll that into like a day of data. And then once I get seven days, I'm going to roll that into like a week of data and just re-tabulate those statistics, but start to lose the granularity over time. Um, that's what we did at that particular job. And it worked out great um, because it does turn into a huge amount of data for sure. Cool. Um, another anonymous question I got. Oh, I followed up in the Minesweeper make change questions. 
were ones asked by my friends who work at Google. Minesweeper is an actual interview question. Make changes a phone screen problem. Yeah. So again, making changes is a pretty common depth first search or dynamic programming based on whether you're doing like top down or bottom up. Um, and with that one, you would either start at the amount of money and work it down to zero, or the other one is you start at zero and you calculate all the different combinations until you get to your target. Um, and so you can solve it with DP, you can solve it with DFS. Um, the, uh, the idea that a lot of people get with dynamic programming is dynamic programming is about the matrix that you build. And that matrix is really just a cache of what you've calculated. And you can also cache things with a depth first search as well, doing top down. So you can also cache that as well. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's a good screen problem for sure. Um, for the Minesweeper one, I mean, that one could also be depth first search, depending on what you're trying to sort of factor in and build and, and things like that too. Would be some uh, interesting things to, to factor into those. Um, one of the other common ones that I've seen is like a grid where you get like ones and zeros and it's like, go calculate all the land masses where one is land and zero is water. And then the flip, the reverse one of that is go calculate all the bodies of water um, where you don't count diagonal adjacency. You only count left, right, up, down adjacency in order to calculate like where a body of water is or where a chunk of land is. Um, that one's really, really common for, uh, for fan companies too. Um, dev crash says make change like from a transaction. So the, the making change problem is usually like, here's a dollar 37. What's the minimum number of coins that you need to make a dollar 37? Well, you would start that by spending the most expensive coins. So how many quarters do you need? Well, what if you have a 50 cent piece? You know, what if you have a $1 coin? Like you have to look at the denominations of what you have and you basically spend the largest amounts of money first. Um, so there, there's two sort of variations on it. One's what's the smallest number of coins you need. And the other one's just like, you have an amount of coins, like how far do you work through the piggy bank, like drawing out one coin at a time until you come up with that amount of money. And when do you start throwing coins away because you're not going to get to that answer, uh, based on what you have. Um, yeah. Um, or do it with modulo. Yeah, you could do it with modulo for sure. Um, you can do it with a, if, with if statements in modulo. Um, I've seen it where you sit in a while loop and you just deduct that same denomination of coin. Um, you could do a modulo and say like, go put as many of these coins as possible. The, the trick with that is what if they say, hey, you don't have a dime, you know, or you don't have nickels or, you know, we're Canada and we got rid of pennies. Um, then what do you do? Now you've got to rethink the strategy a little bit because you may not have like that next smaller denomination of coin to sort of fall back on. Or if it's the variation where you're randomly given a coin and you need to figure out whether to use that coin or not. Um, you don't always want to sit there and just module and say like spend as many quarters as possible or spend as many nickels as possible based on what's left. You may draw a dime and you have to decide whether you use that dime or you throw it away. Um, so there, there are variations of the problem that you have to, you have to look at the wording of it and you have to ask these clarifying questions to know what approach you want to take. Price server asks, what's a good way to learn the theory or algorithmic patterns for these kinds of problems? Is solving problems the best way? Should you read up on the algos first? So the book that was mentioned earlier, Cracking the Coding Interview, there are several books like that that can teach you some of those high level strategies. Um, again, the, the videos that I made that I posted uh, earlier, uh, or at least on my YouTube channel, um, if you go look at Sean Prashad's website that I mentioned, I think in both of those videos, you can say like, Hey, I, I just want to go study depth first search. So you pick that from the, from a dropdown and it shows you just DFS problems. And now you can kind of go look at all of those, look at the wording and go, okay, well, because of these wordings, this is a depth first search problem, or because of the wording that looks this way, it's going to be a dynamic programming problem. Um, but where it's something like making change or the knapsack problem, like those ones, you just kind of study over time and go, okay, if it's a backpack problem, it's probably dynamic programming, but it, there are variations of that problem too. And so you have to pay attention to the wording of the problem to, to really understand what kind of algorithm you want to use. And you can only figure out which algorithm you want to use by studying multiple kinds of algorithms. And so that's why I, I give you that the idea of like, go look at that one video that comes up with a schedule of like, how often do you want to study a depth first search problem? Um, and then like, when do you go back and revisit and like redo that problem again, just so it's always fresh in your mind. Um, I did a, I did some coaching with someone one time and I'm like, yeah, you got to come up with a schedule. 
you know, of these different kinds of problems. They're like, yep, I'm going to spend all this week on depth first search. And next week is going to be breadth first search. And the week after that is going to be all DP. And the week after that is going to be all heap problems. And the week after that will be two pointer problems. And I said, yeah, and three months from now, when you go to that interview and they ask you a de like a DFS problem, it's been three months since you last studied one. Like you need to come up with a regular sort of cadence where you're constantly doing like a DFS. Like every three or four days you're doing a DFS problem or every seven days you're doing like a heat problem or something based on how, like what kinds of these problems you think you should be studying. Um, it's a little bit like working out at the gym. I'm not just going to do like bench press for a week and then never do bench press for another three months. And, you know, next week is all leg day, you know, where I just do squats all day long. And then the week after that, I'm doing nothing but deadlift. You would build your muscles out of proportion. You'd probably hurt yourself. You have to do a constant rotation of different muscle groups all the time. And it's the same thing with these algorithm problems. You have to come up with a cadence where you're doing the same kinds of problems all the time. Um, and so that the one video about uh, reducing the leak code grind basically says like, you know, day one, do a depth first search. Day two, do a breadth first search. Day three, do dynamic programming problem and then redo the depth first search that you did two days ago um, it, because it's about the repetition. And then after you do the problem like two, three, four times, then the next time you do a DFS problem, go pick a new problem. But you also need to repeat it a couple of times over because that's, that's where you start to recognize like, oh, based on that wording, yeah, this is a DFS problem. That's the mindset that you want to get into. So that when you go to a, an actual interview and they say, here's a problem, your brain's going to be like, oh yeah, it's a two-pointed problem. You want it to be that automatic. And the only way you can do that is by studying lots of kinds of problems on a regular basis and have the strategies memorized. So it's not about grinding 500 problems or 900 problems on leak code. It's about understanding the different patterns of problems and how to solve those strategies at a high level so that when you do see a problem, you can knock it out. That's, that's where you want to get to. So it's not about the quantity of the problems that you go do. It's about, do you understand the strategy of how to solve that kind of problem? So to kind of go back to price server's question, like how do you learn those kinds of algorithms? You can study them in a book. I recommend go reverse engineer other people's answers and learn their strategies and then compare all the pseudocode and say, this is, this is approximately how people solve depth first search problems. And then use that strategy the next time you think you need to do a depth first search problem. Try to employ the same sort of approach of loop over a decision, act on, like loop over all your decisions, act on a decision, repeat all the work, undo the decision if it didn't work. It's, it's every depth first search in, in, four, in four steps or backtracking, um, at least a backtracking depth first search. Um, those are the same four main principles. So solving a maze, you have a, a loop of directions. I can go left, I can go right, I can go straight. So I'm going to act on that decision and then I'm going to repeat that work. I'm going to go down that corridor until I hit another intersection. Then I repeat all this all over again. I, I've got my loop of decisions. I act on a decision and then I repeat all that work. If I get to a dead end, I have to undo that decision. I need to go back to where I previously was and go to my next thing in my loop. It's like, well, I tried going left, that didn't work. I'm going to try and go straight and see if that works this time. And if you hit another dead end, you backtrack and you go down a different path instead. So as you learn those kinds of strategies, when you see a problem, you're like, oh, could I utilize a backtracking algorithm for this kind of problem? Is that going to be suitable or not? And like I said, eventually your brain will get to a point where it's going to more quickly identify like, oh, this sounds like a two pointer problem, or this sounds like a sliding window problem or something like that. And because you study those strategies, you'll more easily recall the strategy to apply. DFS Wednesdays, yeah, for sure. Just like Taco Tuesday. Um, RCBNX says, I made a text document of the questions I had difficulty with. And we do the problems once a week. Yeah. And, and it's not about doing the same problem over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, the guy that runs Turing, uh, he used to recommend to students, like, do the same problem 10 times. Like, like write out the code, erase it. Write out the code, erase it. Write out the code, erase it. And do that 10 times. I'm like, three is probably enough. And then move on to another kind of problem like it. Doing the same thing over and over and over again. By the time you get to the fourth or fifth time, it's like, I've memorized this. Like, I know how to solve this exact problem, but that's not necessarily going to help you with a similar problem because it's not going to be exactly the same. It's going to be very similar. It might get you to 70, 80% of the answer, but it's not going to be exactly the same every time. There's always going to be some novel twist on it, especially for larger companies. They spend a lot of time and effort 
carefully crafting their own custom problems and having like multiple solutions for them because a good technical challenge should not have one correct answer. There may be like one more efficient way, one more optimized kind of way, but any good technical challenge should have multiple answers. It shouldn't just have like, this is the, the one way to do this. If that's the case, then they've done the problem wrong. Um, I don't, I don't agree that there's only ever one proper way to do a thing. I think it's a, it's a dangerous precedent to uh, to set. But yeah, coming up with a, a regular cadence of like practice these things more and more often. So again, kind of talking about Sean Prashad's uh, website, let me get the link. I'll drop that in chat for you too. Um, Sean, uh, I actually had Sean on the stream uh, last summer and we talked about how he developed this. And he basically, he found a bunch of other curated leak code problem lists and he has a leak code premium account himself. And so he basically built his own little web interface where you can narrow it down by the pattern of the problem, by the complexity of the problem, as well as by company for the kinds of lists that say like, oh, Amazon asks this kind of question, Facebook asks this kind of question, Google asks this kind of question. So you can go in and say, show me all the dynamic programming problems that Google asks and you know, at an easy level. And it'll show you just those questions if you want to study those. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get that exact question. Because once companies know that their questions got leaked, they stop asking that question and they come up with a new version of it or a completely different uh, scenario. Because they don't want people to like sort of cheat and game the system and come in and look like an amazing programmer when all you did was memorize someone's answer. Um, and so by using Sean's website, what I recommend, and this was kind of in, in one of those leak code videos about reducing the grind, is go, go and use Sean's website and say, okay, it's it's Taco Tuesday or it's DFS Wednesday. It's DFS Wednesday. Let me go find a random DFS problem using Sean's interface. And now I'm just going to go study that. And if I get stuck and I don't remember how to do a DFS problem, I'm going to reverse engineer a couple of other people's answers, kind of get my mind into that, you know, sort of how do I solve this kind of problem? And then once you've got that narrowed down, now it's like, okay, now I can go do that problem. That's really where you want to get to with this. Dev Kresh asks, is it someone's job to make these questions? Like, is it their sole responsibility? It's probably not their sole responsibility, no. Um, but there are certainly people that are like, hey, in my off time, I came up with this problem. What do you think? And they'll all like kind of pick it apart and, and talk about like, well, how would you answer it? You know, here's like maybe some alternate solutions or whatever. And once they kind of practice it out and, and kind of get an idea of like, yeah, this is like a junior level problem or a senior level problem or whatever then they, they might add it to their problem bank. But again, they need to make sure it's really unique and it's applicable to the kind of work that you're going to be doing. Um, and so some companies care a lot about it. When I was an interviewer, um, you know, I'm guilty of just using leak code problems in the past, but then I started kind of shaping my own. Um, or, you know, at the very least, if I was using someone's problem, I would do that as like a phone screen and then their take home assignment was actually based on that work. And so it was like, it was all kind of combined. And so the whole process of the phone screen, the take home, the onsite, it was all around that same problem. And so it was work that you were, that you were already familiar with. It was work that you'd already done, code that you'd already written. It was stuff that you already knew. It was just, we wanted you to expand it and make it bigger and bigger. Um, every company is a little bit different with their process though. Uh, RC Maniac says, my team has a doc of the problems that we ask and it changes by level. Yeah, we had, uh, we had something similar at, uh, at several places that I've worked in the past. Yeah. But again, once, once those questions kind of leak, uh, like you can, you can, you can tell the candidate to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and a lot of the fan companies do, they'll make you sign an agreement saying like, you're not going to talk about the questions that we actually asked. Um, Amazon actually told me as part of their process that I was going to have to sign a non-disclosure and then they never gave me one to sign. So technically I'm not legally obligated to not talk about the, the questions that they asked during the, the loop interviews. So I could go publish that list of questions. I got them all recorded. Um, I won't, but I could, like, I'm not legally bound to, to not do that. Um, but some companies, they, they don't want you to, to leak that kind of information. Because if you think about it, like if I if I go to the interview and I don't do well and I immediately turn around to Dev Crush and say, hey, this is the question that they asked, and you go in and you crush that problem, 
um, you know, I don't get the job and you do. So not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but like they don't want they don't want people to come in knowing what the questions are and knowing what the answers are going to be. They want to see you problem solve on on the fly. That's why we come up with these very unique sorts of scenarios and questions and things like that where, you know, you should really be putting time into like, what is the question we're going to ask? How is this applicable to your job? Like it needs to be, it needs to be really relative or relevant and relative um, to what you're going to be doing on the job. Otherwise they're kind of doing interviewing wrong. Um, but they need to pay attention to the kind of question and, and so on. Now they may say like, oh, go study, you know, traversal algorithms. Well, that covers a lot of a lot of ground. That's depth first search, breadth first search, binary search uh, algorithms. Like those are all like traversal, like graph traversal algorithms, like Dijkstra's and A star and things like that. It's like, okay, well, you know, I can go study those sort of general algorithms because you're very likely to get asked a traversal problem. Those are like the top algorithms right now. Um, is is depth first search, breadth first search, heap problems, dynamic programming problems, and binary search problems, and then just the array problems of iterating over an array and then fast and slow pointer problems and sliding windows over over an array and things like that. So those are like the most common algorithms right now. So again, going back to Sean's website, if you go to Sean's uh, interface and you say, show me all the Google problems. Um, I actually made a suggestion on his on his page, like at the very top, like let's see a frequency of like what kinds of problems we should be studying. And that'll give you an idea of like what kinds of problems to go study more frequently than others. So like if you pull up Amazon, for example, it'll say like depth first search is like their number one. Well, then go study that one way more often than, you know, bit manipulation, which they almost never ask. Doesn't mean they'll never ask it, but they're a lot less likely to ask you a bit manipulation problem. You're far more likely to get asked some kind of traversal algorithm. Um, now, Sean's website's not 100% accurate because Amazon and Facebook last summer and last fall, respectively, both announced that they're not asking dynamic programming problems anymore. And so you can skip those if you're targeting Facebook or Amazon. You don't have to study dynamic programming. I think it's still a useful tool, though, as far as like understanding problem solving and, you know, building up caches of data and things like that. Um, and so you can you can kind of gauge that accordingly. So just be aware that, you know, Sean's list isn't like 100 percent accurate, but it's going to give you a really good idea of the kinds of algorithms that you're going to probably want to get in that study schedule way more frequently. So does that mean it's going to be DFS Wednesday every every week? Maybe, but. It's also like, well, if I'm going to go apply at Amazon or some of these fan companies where DFS is like the most popular one, it might be DFS Wednesday and DFS Saturday every week, you know, and you're going to mix in the other ones like in between, but like the first search, backtracking, um, you know, BFS, like those ones are going to show up in the mix more frequently. Um, or it might be like traversal algorithms like three times a week and then like array problems four days a week or something like however you feel you want to mix it up but it's about coming up with a, a regular rotation where you're not just all in on two-pointer problems that's the only thing that you're studying because when you get to that interview and they give you something that's not a two-pointer problem you're gonna be like oh no i don't know what to do so you gotta constantly figure that out and, and we talked about that a little bit earlier about like how do you how do you balance that out so Price Surfer, for example, you were asking, like, I work full time and I'm trying to study, you know, and I'm trying to, like, keep learning how to code. Like, how do I juggle all that? It is a lot. I look at it this way. <clears throat> You're investing in your career. And so it's a minor inconvenience. Sorry, I take that back. It's a major inconvenience. It's a minor. What's the word I'm looking for? Disruption in your lifestyle for a little while. It's a short-term disruption, but it's a good investment in your career. Lead code problems are not going away anytime soon. I wish they would, but they're not. Companies out there are still using lead code problems all the time. They're not gonna go away. You can prepare for them as best you can and, and hope that you learn enough of the strategies that when you see a problem, you're like, okay, I think it's gonna be this or maybe this. Let me write out some pseudocode for either one. Yeah, it's definitely going to be this one, or I think I can solve it this way. Make that decision, own it, try to solve it. That's the best that you can do. Um, and if you don't get to an answer, that's okay. 
like I said, early in your career, they care a lot more about your process and your communication, like how you're breaking that problem down to try to solve it, than whether your code is amazing. But they still want to see that you can write code, that you can at least get to a solution, but it doesn't have to be like the most beautiful piece of code ever. They're not expecting that from a junior dev. RC Maniac says Twitter asked me to sign an NDA. Yeah. And, and some companies do that a lot more than others. Um, in this job hunt, I didn't sign a single non-disclosure agreement out of 20, what, 28 companies. I didn't, I didn't sign a single NDA for any of them. Um, I would have if they'd asked, I would have, but I didn't. Um, let's see of all of them, of all the offers that I got, only one company asked for a background check. Only one company asked me for references, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and then they called all my references like immediately, like I sent them that list that morning and they called everybody like within a couple of hours. Um, and then they turned around right away and made an offer. So, um, so yeah, you may or may not get asked to sign an NDA. If you don't sign it, you likely won't progress into their interview process. If you do sign it, you are legally bound to like keep your trap shut. Don't talk about what they ask. Um, you don't want to get into legal problems about it. It's really hard for them to trace it back to you unless you're like, you know, tweeting about it or like making very public blogs or like public, you know, GitHub repo or something that they can actually trace back to you. But the worst that they're going to do is just, you know, get a lawyer to send you a cease and desist letter to like take it down. They're not very likely at all to like actually pursue legal action aside from just like, hey, dummy, like take that offline. You weren't supposed to post that. <clears throat> Uh, price server says, you, you say short term, well, let's say I do two questions a day. How long should I expect my prep period to be six months? Um, if you're doing two different questions a day, um, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. So price server, um, get ready to like rapid fire answer some questions here. Um, this is also something that I, that I was thinking about doing with discord is have some way of pulling the audio from discord into here where I can just like, I can pull someone into like a voice channel where we can literally have like a conversation through Discord, but it's still like streaming all the audio out to uh, out to everyone else. Um, it's just, it would make it a lot easier. So price server, um, so you're talking about like, um, how long should your prep be? I would say, what kind of what kind of job are you hoping to get? Like, do you want to do web development? Do you want to do back end? Do you want to do front end? Do you want to do full stack? So tell me like what kind of job you want to get as a developer. Let's start there. Um, from there, I would think about like, what kinds of companies do you want to apply to? Like what kinds of industries are interesting to you? Um, like what kind of software do you want to be building? So you really want Fang as a backend. Okay. So if you want a Fang job, yeah, you're going to be grinding weak code quite a bit. You need to get really solid at the identification of the problem and memorizing those strategies. The good news there is there's really only like a dozen kinds of problems. For some of them, there are like maybe two strategies. Most of them though, there's a single strategy. Like how do you solve a two pointer problem? Well, you have an array, put a pointer at one end, put a pointer at the other end, you're either walking toward each other or you're walking in the same direction where one moves a little faster than the other. Like, but you've got two pointers or two indexes into that array and you're doing something with those indexes to like move them around and find what you're looking for. So there's really one strategy for two pointer problem. Um, something like a sliding window problem there are a couple of strategies. You can do like a left to right pass multiple times. You can do a right to left pass. You could do like a left to right and a right to left pass. But ultimately the, the sliding window is like, how big do I make that window? Like how many array elements do I make? And then how quickly do I slide that window across the array until I get to the other end? Um, and then which direction do I slide that window? So there's like one kind of strategy for sliding window problems. It's like, how big is the window? Which way do I move it? And that's it. There's your strategy for something like a depth first search. There's like one like really well known way for a depth first search, and maybe maybe slight variation of that. But they're both effectively the same thing. Where like the backtracking, you're like looping through like a tree of your data of some kind. Now it doesn't have to be a tree, but you're basically looping through data. You're acting on a decision and then maybe backtracking. For breadth first search, there's like one way to do it. You're using a queue, you're loading up a queue, and then you're checking that queue every time about like what kind of decision to make. 
um, dynamic programming, there are really two ways of doing it, top down and bottom up. And which one's going to be more effective, more efficient, as far as like memory usage and CPU utilization and time complexity, they're slightly different. And so for a DP problem, you got two different ways of doing it. Um, for heap problems, there's like two heaps. You got a min heap or a max heap. Um, but they're all basically the same thing as you're iterating over other data, you're putting it on the heap and then you're pulling out like the, you know, a number off the front of the heap or a number of them off the back of the heap. Um, you can use a queue instead or, you know, like a, like a, a linked list or something like reorganized linked list. You don't have to use a heap necessarily, but a heap is going to kind of sort everything for you as you add things to it. Um, so it's really about like, what are the different patterns? What are the high level strategies to solve each of those patterns? So does it have to be six months? No. If you, if you have the time to spend, like if you've got say two hours a night, I bet you could be fang ready in three or four months, but it really depends on what you're studying in that amount of, amount of time. Like saying, well, I'm going to do like two Lico problems every day for months and months and months. Well, Two problems a day is 60 problems a month-ish on average. So six months down the road, that's 180 days times two is 360 problems. Is that enough for a FANG job? Maybe. Depends on the problems that you're actually doing and how quickly you can solve them. At the end of the day, for them, it's like, what's your process? How are you communicating it? What's your problem-solving strategy? How good is your decision-making? And then, you know, are you somebody that I would be comfortable having on my team? That's really what they're evaluating. So it's, they can't really pin a number on that and say, oh, you know, it's a minimum of 100 or, you know, you need a minimum of 700. I've seen blog posts of people saying like, oh, yeah, I, I grinded Lee code and I've done like 900 problems. So, yeah, I got I got a Facebook job in like a week. It's like, well, good for you. Not everybody's got that kind of time. And so for me, that's why I made those YouTube videos. It's like, how do we how do we optimize that process of what are the patterns? What are the strategies? How do I study those strategies? And then how do I tie those strategies to the wording of the problem so that as I'm practicing several of them, like, you know, maybe do two a day or three a day, just to look at the wording and go, oh, yeah, that's a sliding window problem. Or, oh, yeah, that's a heat problem. Or, oh, this one's actually sliding window and two pointer. Because uh, sometimes it'll be both. Um, or, or sometimes there'll be a mix and match of them. Um, and so those, those are going to be more on the, like, harder level of problems. Usually there's, like, one pattern that they want you to solve. Um, and so I think that there's a, a way that you can really optimize that and make that more effective than just grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. Uh, Deb Crush says, if OBS picks up your audio by device. Yeah, so I've, I've got like Spotify, for example, that's coming through like a fake audio channel and that broadcasts out as part of OBS. So I know I can. I just have to figure out like how to plug that into OBS as an audio source um, so that I can actually control the the, uh, the audio of it um, but yeah it would be nice to do like I, I was trying to think of some way of like is there a way that I could bring that in so that people can like sort of like call in and like just have a quick thing and that might be where like as an admin I basically set that voice channel to like I can pull people into there and I can mute you and unmute you so I could actually have like a whole bunch of people in there and just say like okay dev crash your turn you're unmuted Let's go ahead and ask your question and just keep that open. We'll have our conversation and be like, okay, cool. You good? All right. I'm going to boot you out of there and get on to the next person kind of thing. That's kind of my ultimate goal for, for that. And that's why I was trying to set up discord today. Um, RC maniac helps out in chat, casual comment. You don't always get to choose. Google basically says software engineer, manager, SRE, etc. And then when you finish the interview, so there are some roles ahead of time where you know you're applying for an SRE role or you know you're applying for a manager role, but they will also generally interview you and get through the first couple of interviews and go, okay, you're going to fit in on this kind of team best. Or, hey, now that we've interviewed you and we see about your background and, and the kinds of things that are interesting to you, would you be willing to work on this team or this team because you're going to continue your interview with them? Um, so sometimes they'll pick the team partway through. Sometimes, though, it's like, oh, you're applying for a software developer job for Google Drive or Google Billing or, you know, whatever. And it, like that whole process is geared specifically to that particular kind of role with that team already in mind. Um, but sometimes it's just like, yeah, we're hiring software developers all the time. And as we interview you, we'll figure out like where to put you. 
sometimes the where to put you part can actually put a pause on the interview for weeks at a time. Um, and that's not always ideal. If you're trying to get a job now and you've got other jobs on the go, you're not always going to be able to pressure Google into saying like, hey, can you hurry this up because I'm finishing up some other interviews. Google's like, no, this is our process. Like, you got to wait until we find a team that you're going to fit in on and then we'll resume the interviews. And so I would say if it's a thing company like that, like that kind of role, I would say it's probably... Like, I would probably just interview at just fan companies, figure those out, and then, like, go do other interviews. If you really want fang, though, here's my other tip. If you really want a job at fan companies, go interview at a bunch of other companies first, get all the nerves out, get the jitters out of, like, oh, how do I talk about my background? How do I talk about this or that? Um, it's something that I did in this job hunt, you know, 30 companies or whatever that I interviewed at. Um, I was probably really bad at the first 10, 15 of those interviews talking about what I want to do, talk about my background. I was like constantly jumping around like, oh, let me tell you about this job. But if I go further back, I can talk about this. But, you know, my most recent job, I was doing such and such. And so I'm like constantly jumping around. And that answer wasn't really clear. By the time I got to these last like 10 companies where I got, what, five or six offers out of it, they're like, tell me about yourself. I'm like, boom, 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 boom. They're like, this is awesome. And that's why... A lot of the companies where I got these offers, their interview process was really short. Like the whole process ended up being really short because I was able to clearly communicate the value that I bring to the team and the kinds of skills that I have. And they're like, yeah, you're what we want on the team. So that's why I was getting offers really quickly. But if you're new and you're not practiced at how to talk about those kinds of things, I would do a bunch of interviews with a bunch of other companies, startups, small size companies, whatever, get that out of the way get the nerves out, practice, get feedback from them, figure out what you can do better, practice that kind of stuff, and then go interview with the companies where you really want that job. If you go interview at a fan company and you don't get their job, they might make you wait six months to reapply. So what are you gonna do in that six months? Are you just gonna continue to study and grind and be unemployed or do like whatever your other job is for another six months? Or can you go do like a couple of like sort of burner interviews, get them out of the way, get some practice in, and then go get go get the interview for the job that you don't want. Trader Joe Bag, welcome. Thanks for the follow. There's some blinky lights here in the background. Welcome to you. Thanks for uh, stopping by. I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the uh, author of this website, techinterview.guide. And I just love helping people out with my perspectives on interview prep and career prep and stuff like that. Thanks for your stream. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Trader Joe. Like, what? Like, are you on the job hunt? Or are you doing interview prep? I'm always curious, like, how people find out about my stream and kind of what's going on in your world. Um, so yeah, I love I love just helping people out. This is this is everything about my stream. On Thursdays, I tend to have well, I'm starting now to trend to have uh, guests on Thursdays. Um, this coming Thursday, that reminds me, I gotta go find a link. This coming Thursday. Um, I have a recruiter friend of mine from San Diego coming on the stream. He will not have video. He's just going to be like a static image, but his audio will be on the uh, on the site. But um, I made a Google form that I'm going to drop in the chat here. Um, as soon as I pull it up, fine. Um, we want a whole bunch of questions for this recruiter. Like if you could ask a recruiter any question, what would you ask? Um, and so I'm going to drop a link in the channel right now. <clears throat> if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll get it in the description as well. Um, this Google form is anonymous. It's just asking for a question. It's not asking for your name. It's not asking for your email. This is not tied to an individual in any way. I have no idea who's filling this out and I don't care to know. But what we want to do is when we have Alex on the stream this coming Thursday is we're going to go through these questions and we're going to ask the recruiter your questions. Like if you could ask a recruiter anything, now you're welcome to come by the stream and ask questions live. Absolutely. That's always going to be a part of my stream, but we do want a bit of a queue of these questions up front. Um, the following Thursday, uh, February 3rd, I'm going to have a panel of people. I think I've got four people lined up right now. I'm going to start to confirm with them that that date is still good. But Thursday, February 3rd, I'm going to have four people on the stream and we're just going to rant about why companies don't hire junior devs. That's all it's going to be. It's just going to be a bunch of old senior devs just griping about like, why don't companies hire juniors? 
Um, I think it's going to be a good discussion. So absolutely drop by, listen in, ask us questions as well. Um, it's, it's a whole bunch of other people that do interview prep and coaching and things like that. I'm going to have folks on the stream like Dan Moore, who's been on the stream uh, twice, once or twice. I forget how many times Dan's been on the stream now. Uh, I, think, I think once. This will be Dan's second time. Um, but I've also got a number of other people, uh, a couple of them I've never even met, but we've interacted on Twitter and I'm like, I got to get you on my stream. And we kind of all decided like, hey, we need to like pool our, our thoughts together about why it's so hard for entry level devs to get their first job in tech. So that's going to be a whole thing. That's going to be February 3rd. February 10th, if anybody knows Chris Perillo uh, from Twitch, um, he generally streams at 7 p.m. most nights. I don't think he's streaming tonight though, is he? Up to uh, find a tab and see if, if, uh, if he's actually streaming tonight. Um, but uh, Chris is kind of like a tech news kind of celebrity type of person. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe Chris. Um, Chris used to be like on a like a tech news kind of thing where it was like kind of like a news broadcast. People could call in with questions, um, stuff like that. Yeah, he's actually streaming right now. Chris Perillo. Um, we're going to have him on the stream on February 10th. Chris is one of these like super animated kind of guys. Um, he's really, he's like the biggest Star Wars nerd you'll ever meet. And he also loves Lego. He's also big into 3D printing. And uh, I've been hanging out on his stream for a while. And he came and he's, he's listened in on a couple and he's rated us a couple times. Um, and Chris is just one of those like really fantastic personalities of just someone who's got a lot of energy and loves to learn from other people. And so um, he came by the stream one time. I'm like, Chris, I want to see like your LinkedIn. I want to like, you know, critique your resume. So he agreed. So February 10th, we're going to have Chris on the stream. He knows his resume is like super jacked up and he knows his LinkedIn is garbage. So we're going to go through and we're going to make him like a really nice LinkedIn profile and t show him how he should be building uh, a resume. So we're going to go through that process with him. We'll probably do it for like 45 minutes, maybe an hour at most. Um, he really likes his stream, so I don't want to take too much time because we do stream at the exact same time. He streams at 7 p.m. Um, the wild card. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Give some ruby lights here in the background. Appreciate you dropping by. Yeah, he streams every day. Like he's literally like seven days a week. He's he's pretty hardcore for sure. He's got a pretty big audience, so he's gonna come by. Um, I think he's just gonna redirect his stream over to mine, or we'll figure something out there. Um, but yeah, we're basically gonna go live with Chris, and we're gonna basically tear apart his LinkedIn. And we're going to tear apart his resume. He's not looking for a job, but he knows that it's something that he should be keeping up to date and, and things like that, just so people can help find, like people can find him for like content and whatever that kind of stuff. So should be uh, should be pretty entertaining for sure. Yeah, he's a manager over at Intel right now, on an unannounced tech product. Interesting. But yeah, he uh, he loves Star Wars. He's always nerding out on Star Wars. He's got like just tons of figurines. Like every stream, he's like, I got this new figurine in the mail. He's, he's always got like something showing up. Uh, he's, he's a really great guy. Really, really great guy. He's probably going to auto host the stream. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So we need to, we need to like work on that ahead of time. So we got all our ducks in a row, but cool. Um, I got one more kind of anonymous question that I'm going to go through tonight. Um, but definitely keep dropping stuff in, in chat. Uh, one more that I want to get through and then, uh, I think I'll start to wind down cause we're, we just hit two hours. Wow. Two hours goes by in like a blink around these parts. It's pretty great. And thank you in advance. Um, I usually say this at the very end of the stream, but really appreciate everybody dropping by and sharing their perspectives and ideas. RC Maniac, it's always great having you in chat. And Zooey, if you're still around, it's always great having all you folks around uh, in chat and just helping people out. See some of the old regulars, uh, Tech Dinosaur, Python, Nate, you're all kind of quiet tonight. Usually you're a little chatty. But uh, yeah, I love having new people come by. And DevCrash, you've been hanging out with us a lot lately too. So I really appreciate all of you coming by. Um, so if if you're if you've like joined the Discord, um, like let me know what I need to fix in there. Um, DevCrash, if if you're around, if you got some time to uh, to chat about that, um, I'd love to uh, kind of get that worked out too. Parachute drop, yeah. So I got parachute drop working. It works on some of the screens on OBS. It won't work on all of them. But we'll work on this one if you want to do a little parachute drop. And I think there's like a bang cut that you can do that like cuts your parachute. So, 
Trader Joe says, this stream makes me so excited thinking about a tech career. I mean, tech careers are great and it doesn't have to be just software development. So that's, that's something that uh, I mentioned earlier on the stream that I want to do more of is talking about tech adjacent roles. Like what are some roles in the tech industry that are not full-time software development? Because there are tons of jobs that you can get. Um, the Brianator Dev, thanks for the follow-up, appreciate you grabbing by. Um, but yeah, I heard that there's like a bang cut that you can do at some point that like cuts your parachute to try to hit the target or something like that. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think you have to do it like fairly early, like as you're dropping down the screen. I think if you wait till the very end, I think it, because it takes a few seconds for it to see your command and then send it to the web server that's playing the game and whatever. Something like that. I have seen it where like someone just suddenly drops on the on the screen. Um, I don't know if I can, can I play my own game? Oh, I can. So I'll try and throw a cut in here, see if that does anything. The only downside is it shows up in the chat over here in this window. No, maybe cut doesn't work. I have seen it in someone else's channel though, where there was like a cut command that actually like cut their parachute. Anyway, I've seen uh, people like Trash Dev. He's got a thing on his where if you like, if you get a hundred percent, like you hit like the bullseye dead on, you get like a gifted sub or something for a month. Uh, I don't do this for money. So, I mean, if you want to subscribe, you can, but uh, I don't, I don't do this for money whatsoever. But uh, yeah, it's it's a fun little gimmicky thing for sure, and you know the the little squeak that happens when you when you drop is pretty fun too. Um, RC Maniac's given some advice to Dev Crush. Try to intern somewhere. Yeah, so there are companies right now that are hiring interns. Um, I would say a lot of the fall like internship deadlines are, tend to be more like October November, but there are companies now that are trying to hire internships for the summer if you can wait until summer. Not everybody's got the time to wait though. And that's the that's the, the thing that you have to balance of like, when do you need the job? And when do you start looking for that job? Because there's there's a time gap in there of like when you start applying for jobs and when you actually get through all their interviews and then you get the job offer, that takes time. Uh, with internships, um, they tend to be short term. So they'll tend to be like a three or four month job and then it ends. Some companies, though, if they like you enough, they'll extend it and just say, like, hey, we want to turn you into a full-time dev. Um, so some companies will use that for entry-level developers. It's kind of like the probation period that, that other places do where they're like, you know, oh, for 90 days, you're kind of on probation, or we're going to hire you as a contractor for 90 days and then convert you to full-time. They're all kind of doing the same thing. It's really just kind of like, are you going to work out? Like, how can we make this as easy as possible to, like, cut you off kind of like cutting the parachute on on this game like is there a quick and easy way of just like stopping that and say you're not working out but in the united states like more and more states are what we call at will employment which means you can quit for any time for any reason they can fire you for any time for any reason uh, with no notice and so companies don't really have to do that anymore the downside for them if they hire you as a full-time employee is they've got to pay benefits and they got to, you know, all that kind of stuff and all the payroll taxes and blah, blah, blah. And if they terminate you, um, I don't know if, I don't think, do they pay unemployment? I don't know how unemployment works. I've never had unemployment. Um, if they terminate you, you can apply for unemployment. If you quit, you don't get unemployment or there's some circumstances where you can be. Most of the time you don't get unemployment. Um, and so um, I think a lot of companies don't take full advantage of the whole at will kind of thing. And they would rather just, you know what, we'll just put you as like contract to hire or bring you in as an intern and then like convert you over. What you have to be careful of with internships is that it's not on the, an unpaid internship. I strongly recommend don't ever do an unpaid internship. If that's the only possible way you can get a job, then okay. But as soon as you start that internship, start looking for another job. Um, because if they're if they're not paying you for the amount of effort that you're putting in, it doesn't feel great. You should be paid for your time, uh, no matter what level of developer experience you have or whatever kind of technical role you're doing. If you're doing that work, you should be paid for it. That's my belief. Um, in some states, it's illegal to have an unpaid internship. So know know your area, know what to, know your laws and things like that. Uh, Debrinator, first time chat. Uh, I'm a web, I'm at a web dev internship right now and I love it, but the imposter syndrome really hits hard. Oftentimes I feel like asking, am I doing this right? I've been doing this for 26 years. I ask those same questions. 
I'm going to be honest with you. Um, my imposter syndrome has never really gone away, especially in interview scenarios. The difference is though, when I go interview now with 26 years of experience, I have better stories to tell, but I always second guess myself when I'm coding of like, oh, they're watching me code. What if I screw this up? They're going to be like, look at this guy, 26 years experience and can't write a depth first serve, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't want to look like an idiot. And so my imposter syndrome goes way up. Um, it's something that you just, you, it's not that you have to live with it, but you learn to mitigate it a little bit. In an internship role though, they know you don't know a lot and it's okay. They gave you that internship because they believe you can do the job and they believe that you can do it to the extent that like they've got an expectation and your interview met that expectation. They believe in you. We believe in you. Go do the job. That's the best I can tell you. Um, sometimes you have to just believe that other people believe in you when you don't believe in you. Um, and it's, it's a hard one to, to kind of take sometimes because when you have that internal sort of voice going, you're no good at this and other people are like, you're amazing at this. And you're like, no, I'm really not. Like if you really knew, you'd know, I'm really not good at this, but you met their expectation. You made it through their interview. You got hired as an intern. You can do the job. So just tell yourself that. Or go back and clip the, you know, that two minute video and like play that back to yourself over and over again. We all believe in you. You can do this. They hired you. You met their expectation. You can do the job. Are you doing it right? That's why they have senior level devs. They don't expect your code to be brilliant and amazing. They expect your code to work. Other people are going to help make it better. They believe in you. Do your best. That's it. That's all you need. Yeah, you're welcome. It's, it's hard to get through. It's hard to get through that. Um, and I've, I've dealt with it a lot in my career of like, oh gosh, they hired me as a lead or they hired me as a senior or they hired me as a manager. Like, what am I doing in a director role? Like, ah, like I don't deserve this. It's like I interviewed, I passed their interview. Clearly I showed them I can do the job to their level of like what they expect. So all these job offers that I've been juggling, it made the imposter syndrome really kick in especially when you start getting like multiple offers you're like am i really good enough for like any one of these jobs yeah otherwise i wouldn't have got the job offer and it's it's hard sometimes to tell ourselves that but i get where you're coming from i empathize with you strongly on that one for sure um the best i can do is tell you we believe in you they believe in you hopefully that's enough until you believe in you cheers This pineapple hint water is weird. Like most of their, like it's it's a hint of flavor. So like most of them is like, yep, tastes like watermelon or like, yep, that one's got watermelon and a bit of mint in it. This one's like, what's wrong with this water? Oh, it tastes like pineapple. This is like one of those flavors where you drink it and you're like, something's off. All the rest of them is like, blam, watermelon or like, blam, it's cherry. And this one's like, hmm. This channel is not sponsored by Handwater. I just, I'm a big fan of their product, that's all. Clipping's not enabled on Twitch? Ah. All right, well, I'll clip that little video out for you and I'll, uh, I'll send it over to you. Send me, send me a whisper on Twitch and I'll, uh, I'll clip the video out and send it over to you. Yeah, gotta, gotta definitely stay uh, hydrated at this job. So I've got in my whole basement, my basement's about 900 square feet. In my entire basement, there's one air vent coming off the furnace and it's right here above me so it's constantly blowing dust like all over my computer equipment but I get this blast of hot air coming down at me and my feet are always freezing down here and so I've got a space heater like right below me under the desk here blowing warm air up at me and so it makes my throat and voice really raspy after two hours of talking that's why I'm kind of like ah, ah, I gotta drink more water and that's also why I the channel fit uh, kind of thing of like redeem some uh, channel points for telling me to hydrate otherwise I just I get really raspy and end up making you an offer you can't refuse you never do flavored water I've been thinking about trying their sparkling water but uh, you've all seen me on the stream when I drink soda and stuff I end up burping a lot I don't want to belch in the microphone that's rude you're not here to hear me belch and you know whatever you're here to get some perspective on interview prep and career prep that's why i'm here not to not to belch at you it's also why i don't drink beer and stuff on the stream either so i'd be like Bleh. 
all the time, like Barney and Simpson in The Simpsons. Good times, good times. And it's really, really hard for me not to sit here and snack on a giant bag of sunflower seeds. Let me tell you, it's like my vice right here. I'm just like, rah, 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 and sunflower seeds all day long. Uh, which also, you know, I got to hydrate and just keep the water levels up because this stuff's super salty. Anyway, if you burp the alphabet, it'll be like high school all over again. Yeah, I appreciate that, RC Maniac. <laughs> I promise not to do that. Um, so yeah, I actually made, I made myself like, you know, when I, when I hit the button on my stream deck, it says go live and it starts that four minute countdown and it tweets and I'm going live and, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways of like automating all the lights when I hit that button too. I have to like purposely clear my desk of things that it's like, well, I could eat the sunflower seeds, but I don't have the little trash can thing that I use to put the shells in. So I'm like, oh, I want a sunflower seed, but wait, I don't have a place to like put the shell afterwards. And I don't want to just set it on my desk. So I like put that stuff away and I like put all the soda back in the fridge and stuff so I don't have it here to like munch on and sip and belch and whatever throughout the uh, throughout the stream. But anyway, it's always uh, it's always fun hanging out with everybody. Um, there was something else I was going to mention and now I don't remember what. Oh, I just remembered. Um, I won't encourage anybody to buy merch, but if you really, really want it, I got tech interview guide mugs that you can get. Share what you know, we all win. And I've got a desk mat um, already made up. I've got I got one on the uh, on the stream now. Let me see if I can get the photo up. Let's see if I can share the photo. Yeah, photo at least. Photos. I took a picture of it after I cleaned off my desk because my desk was also like horrifically dirty. Thought I took a picture of it. Yeah, there it is. So let's go back over to this right here. So yeah, so I got this cool little like tech interview guide desk mat now. So it's pretty fun. You can order one of those if you want. I've got two more. I've got one in a in a charcoal gray, and I've got one in black. Um, and I'm gonna be like ordering like a bunch of random merch and like of my own, including these mugs. And uh, once I launch the new email series, I'm gonna do a giveaway. And I'm actually going to like send this stuff out to people or I'll figure out like how to give you a credit in the store and you can just go like buy one for free um, if you want one, if you care. Um, I think they'll also do like just a mouse pad and stuff like that, but I've got like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like I literally make like a couple of bucks off. I don't do this to make money at all. Any profit that I do make from selling that merchandise, I'm actually going to turn around and like give to uh, like other like boot camps and like charitable organizations and stuff like that that are helping people learn how to code uh so i'm a big big fan of like helping other people learn and i don't do this stream at all to make money um, i appreciate the subscribers but i don't do this to make money now if you if you want you can subscribe on youtube that's just going to give you a notice of like when i take this video and upload it to youtube uh, but yeah you can always uh, just follow on twitch and stuff like that anyway i feel like i'm like babbling and rambling on now um two hours and 16 minutes. I think I'll start to wrap up. Unless there are any other last minute questions. I think I had one more. In... Oh yeah, I do have one more anonymous question I'm going to get to you from, uh, from Discord. Um, so this person was asking, like they were asking like, what kinds of things should I learn to get into the tech industry? And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And things like that. And they said, well, I want to learn Python and I want to learn this and this and this and this. I'm like, go learn one thing. It's a different person, but it was the same advice. Like, go learn one thing, learn it really well. And they're like, well, what can I do with Python? And so their question was, what kinds of roles are there for Python? Uh, which of those can I get into as quickly as possible for somebody that's brand new at programming? This person's like currently in the medical industry um, and they want to transition into tech. So they're basically asking like, what kinds of roles can I get as a developer using Python? which of those can I get into the fastest and then which of those roles have like the most jobs and most job security. And so I basically wrote them back. I'm like, well, they're like, Python's a pretty general purpose language. Like there's so many kinds of jobs that you can do with Python. Um, Zoe, good to see you. Uh, have a great night. Um, Zoe, call me in the morning or like uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. We'll have that chat in the morning. Um, I said with Python, you can do data engineering, you can do data science, you can do machine learning, you can do general purpose programming, you can do web development, you can do back-end development, you can do desktop development. Uh, there are libraries out there, you can get into like mobile development with it too. Um, and it'll like convert it all into like Android or iOS 
and like compile down blah 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 so you can do a ton of stuff with python and like it really comes down to like what interests you because i was trying to caution them like don't go into like yeah there are a ton of machine learning jobs and data science jobs if you're really good at math there's a ton of data engineering jobs if you like manipulating data and like doing that kind of stuff with data if you love nerding out on that and like calculating statistics and whatever like go do that if you really like the idea of building web applications you can go do that but like don't just chase the money you have to enjoy what you're doing so yeah there are a lot of jobs and some of those avenues some of them are very very well paying but if you're not good at the job or you get into it and you don't like the job what are you doing it for like you need to find a job that you're gonna love like the company the product like whatever it is you're building you have to love that worry a little bit less about you know which of these avenues have the most jobs and which ones of them pay the best and it's like you're getting into it for the wrong reasons um now that's not to say it's a bad thing to like go chase that bag as they say like go get your bag go get that bag of cash that's fine if if that's what motivates you and that's why you want to get into development that's fine but if you're not bringing that passion to the job it's a lot harder to get through an interview if they're like why do you want to work here you're like, oh, I heard your salaries are enormous. It's like, eh, I'm not going to interview you anymore. Thanks for coming in. Like, I want to know, like, if I'm interviewing you, I want to know you care about my company. You care about my team. You care about what we're building. You care about where we're going. You care about what we're doing as a company. That's what stands out in an interview. When I say, tell me about yourself, I want you to tell me all the skills that you're bringing to my team and convince me we're headed in the same direction. That's what's going to make you a great person to hire. That's where you're going to progress through the interviews. That's where you're going to progress and get the job offer. That's where you're actually going to get that job. If you don't do a good job explaining why you're a good fit and why you belong at that company, you're going to have a lot harder time getting through the interview. Can you fake it? Sure. Absolutely. You can fake it. Our company is just like, we need people to just do development. Like we don't even care if you like the work. We just like, we'll pay you oodles of money. That's fine too. Those companies exist. But I think if you can really enjoy the company, really enjoy the product, really enjoy the role that you're in and what you're building and why you're building it, you're going to have such a much better career at the end of the day. RC Maniac, you, you hit it right on the head. If you don't like your job, you're going to hate every day. Exactly. Especially with remote jobs. It's like, ugh. It's like I'm going to roll out of bed at like two minutes before I'm supposed to be at the office. I'm going to throw on a ball cap and be like, I'm here. And Chad, here's my stand-up notes for the day. I guess I'm going to kind of grind through the same crap I was doing yesterday. It's like, if you don't enjoy it, it's going to show in the quality of your work. It's going to show in your motivation. Um, but again, if that money is what motivates you, it's like, all right, let's dive in. Payday's coming up. You know, got got that trip planned out. I'm going to go spend that cash and like, you know, go hang out in, you know, some saltwater ocean south of the equator somewhere. It's like, that's fine if that's your thing. If that's what's going to drive you and motivate you to do a good job. But I think uh, I think it's a lot harder to convince them during the interview that you care about their company and care about their product if that's your primary motivation. So you can you can fake it. You can get through the interview. You can get job offers where you're literally just there to get the money. That's fine. If you can show them that you have that passion and drive, you're going to get through those interviews faster. You're going to get the job offers faster if you can really convince them that you're the right person for the job and that you're bringing something to the team that's gonna make the team better and the company better. Uh, Trader Joe Bag says, a lot of jobs ask you to be familiar with a million things. It feels a little demoralizing. Yep, um, don't believe those job descriptions. I've written those job descriptions in the past. I've gotten a lot better at it myself that now when I write a job description, I'm like, these are like the two or three absolutely required skills. And here's a list of like a dozen things that'd be cool if you bring any of this stuff to the team. But these are like the one or two things I absolutely need you to have. And it might be like, I need a certain number of years of just general experience. And I need you to be like, I need you to hit the ground running on whatever, whether it's building an API or a specific technology or something. But I'm going to limit that list myself when I write job descriptions. I'm going to limit that to like two things, maybe three things. And then I'm going to have a list of like a dozen things. Like if you happen to work with this specific database, amazing. But if you've also worked with these other databases that are like 90% the same as this one, that's fine too. 
I word my job descriptions differently than a lot of other companies. A lot of other companies are like, here's a hundred things you need to know and you need to have like 50 years of experience in all of them. But uh, by the way, this is a junior dev job, but you still need to have like five plus years experience in all these things. Well, no one's gonna have that. So read those job descriptions really carefully, find out what the company does, do some networking with that company and find out which of these skills do I really need to have in order to qualify for that job. Reach out to the hiring manager, DM the hiring manager, find them on LinkedIn, find them on Twitter, direct message them and say like, hey, I saw the job description. I don't have 100% of those skills. Which ones are really critical? Because I really want to apply for that job. I feel I'm a good fit, but I only have like a couple of the things on that list. Which ones are the most necessary to bring to the team? And they'll tell you. They'll tell you, you just have to ask. Um, Sometimes they'll go to HR and say, yeah, I'm looking for a person with such and such tech stack. And if they're not technical, they're just like, all right, what's that tech stack about? And they'll go look at other job descriptions for that kind of role with that kind of tech stack. And they'll literally copy other job posts. And like, sometimes they won't even even use that technology. In my experience as a hiring manager, people that would send a cover letter and a resume that covered like a hundred percent of that stuff were usually lying. It's really rare to find a candidate coming in where they literally have everything on that list. It's extremely rare. It's my birthday wish list, basically, as a, as a hiring manager. I hope I can find somebody that's got all that stuff. I'm not gonna find that person. That person doesn't exist. If they do, amazing. But they probably want a salary that's double what I'm paying because they have all of those skills. They legitimately have all those skills. So I would reach out to the hiring manager and say, which of these are actually critical skills to have to get the job? Because I'm new in the industry. This is what I do bring. Would, would that be enough to even like bother applying? And they'll tell you, or you can ask like what, you know, these are the skills I have. What other skills can I continue to work on and build up in order to be a good applicant for this job? And they'll tell you like, Hey, go build me a project with such and such and show me how you can go learn this thing. And they might get you into the interview process anyway doesn't hurt to ask. You can always ask. Um, so yeah, I would reach out, connect with them, network with them, find out, talk to them about it. It's, it's all about communication at that point. Uh, RC Maniac says, I will admit there were companies I applied to where I had to really work to figure out why I'm interviewing there because it was just the money. Interviewing for a year plus eventually lowers your bar for what you do. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think for the first couple of months of a job, inter like a job hunt process, you can be like, nope, I'm gonna hold to my principles and I'm only gonna look for these kinds of jobs. And after a while you're like, all right, bank account's empty, gotta gotta do something, need any kind of job, like any, any, any kind of job now. Um, yeah, that can happen, absolutely. My last company told me that they made a job description about, we need someone that knows databases and then HR adds like 30 things and puts three to five years, yeah. So don't believe those things reach out to the hiring manager, network with them directly and say, hey, I saw this job post. I don't have that level of experience, but I'm really interested in the role. This is what I do have. What's your suggestion? Sometimes they'll go back to HR and be like, what are you doing? Like, no one's gonna apply for a junior role with three to five years experience. Like that's, those don't match. Again, a lot of HR people are not necessarily technical. Even if it's a tech company, people in HR may not have enough technical background to write proper job descriptions. <clears throat> That's why you got to network. You got to reach out to people there and be like, what do I really need to know? Starts with communication. Start with that. That's why networking is part of your company research. Or do I want to work there? Let me go like find a developer and say, hey, saw this job post. It's even better if you reach out to the hiring manager, like find, find an engineering manager or a manager in like whatever kind of technical division that you want to work at within the company if it's not a developer job. Go find a manager, a manager. It doesn't have to be the hiring manager for that role. Find any manager and say, saw the job description. I match probably 30% of it. How much of this do I absolutely need to have in order to get into the application process? And they'll tell you, you just gotta ask. Cool, I'm going on two and a half hours. So I'm gonna wrap up for the night. Um, let's go see who else is on here. Chris is still going. Um, I kind of wish I could go raid Bob Ross's channel as much as I don't like the company that like is making the money off of Bob Ross now. 
Bob Ross is just amazing to go listen to, especially on a Sunday night where you just want some mellow time and you just want to like pass out on the couch. Um, so I, I do recommend like go watch Bob Ross, but um, I don't really agree with like all the business practice going on there. Anyway, uh, Dick Fresh, good to have you. You're welcome. Thanks for dropping by. Trader Joe, come by again. Please come by and visit us again. I'm always happy to help people out. Um, and to everyone else, all the other new followers, Wildcard, uh, to Brianator, Spain, if you're still there, uh, Zextrophia, um, as well as some other follows before the stream, the very YOLO guy, Price Server, uh, Lau Visa, lots of interesting uh, names came through and followed. Appreciate all the follows. I always appreciate the follows. Uh, but yeah, come back, hang out anytime. Um, as I kind of fix and refine that Discord, I'll make that more prominent or whatever. I'll put it like in this little text right under my window here. Um, and uh, like I said, I'll, I'll post it on YouTube eventually, but until I get all the permissions and stuff sorted out on the channels, I won't, uh, I won't publicize it too much just yet. Cool, wildcard. Yeah, appreciate the uh, first time chat. Uh, looking forward to dropping by in the future. Awesome. Yeah, so this Thursday we're going to have the recruiter. So um, definitely, let me go find that link again. Help me out and, and uh, go to this Google Doc as soon as I find it. Here it is. Um, go to this Google Drive link. It's just a Google form, and it's like, go ask a recruiter anything. And just drop some questions in there. Like, if you could ask a recruiter any kind of question about what they do in their job or how they screen things or how they look at a resume, like, no questions off limits here. Whatever you want to ask a, a recruiter, drop those in, uh, in that form for me. And uh, we're going to have Alex on the stream Thursday night, uh, same time, so 6 p.m. Eastern, 9, 9 p.m. Uh, sorry. 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 7 p.m. Mountain is when I go live here in Denver. Um, but yeah, we're going to have Alex on the stream this Thursday. The following Thursday is going to be a panel of, I think, three other people and me or four other people and me. And we're just going to like rant and rave about hiring junior devs um, and why the industry needs to be better about that and not ghosting them and actually like getting people interviewed. And then the following Thursday, we're going to have Chris Perlo and we're going to be uh, tearing apart his LinkedIn and his resume. That should prove to be... Uh, some good entertainment for an evening. Um, if you want to be on the stream, if you've got like a technical background and you want to like come hop on the stream and like introduce yourself, like I'm happy to do that too. Just go ahead and whisper me on Twitch or reach out on reach out on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, any of those places. Let's let's have a chat. I love having other perspectives on the stream. I think it's important that it's not just me and my opinions. I'm a white dude in tech. There's enough white dudes in tech spouting opinions. Um, I love having other people on the platform, though, that we can learn from their perspectives as well. Um, I've had a lot of really cool people. Uh, I had Mike Chen on last week. I had Jerome Hardaway uh, from Vetsu Code. We had uh, Jamira McCullers uh, at the beginning of the year. I just I love having people with lots of diverse background. Uh, who else did we have? We had, um, shoot, I see his name. I, I see his face, uh, Garcia, Eric Garcia. Uh, we had him on here as well and, and just sharing their journey into tech and, and their experience with interviewing both as interviewers as well as candidates um so yeah i love having different people on the on the stream um <laughs> you want to hear the junior dev rant so do i so do i i think it's i think it's going to be uh i think it's going to be good what, my my main hope there is like can we as a community start to reach out to other companies and be like hey your interview process is broken and maybe collectively as a community come up with like some sort of structure of like this is how to interview a junior dev here's how to bring a junior dev on your team here's how to support them here's what you need to like interview them hire them onboard them support them mold them into what you want them to be and like publish that as a community get some companies to try it make that like open communication of them getting feedback on like this is what worked this is what didn't work or like yeah y'all were right like why didn't we do this years ago kind of thing um like, I would love to have a way for our community, like, just as developers, not necessarily this, like, my community, but, like, the development community at large, we'll work out some kind of process and give that to companies and say, please try this, report back to us what was good, what didn't work out. I think there are enough of us senior devs and, like, really old, really, really senior devs in the industry that can really help shape and mold this. Um, and there's, you know, all we need is a couple of companies to try it and then feed that back and, and make it better, constantly iterate on it. Like, you know, what about this kind of question? What about that kind of question? What about this scenario? What if this happens? Like, take questions from all sides, 
refine that process and start giving that out, open source it to other companies and be like, this is how you bring a junior dev on your team. That's my ultimate vision. I think that that would be fantastic. So we're going to have a whole panel about that February 3rd. Uh, so it'll be a Thursday. Definitely come back for that. So yeah, anyway, I'm going to wrap up for the night. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Let's go raid Chris. Um, and then uh, we will call it a night from there. So let me just set up a raid. And we'll catch you all on Thursday. Have a good night, everyone. Five, four, three. Drop a chat in... Uh, or drop a message in chat when we get over to Chris's channel. Let him know that we're there. Make some noise. Grunt like a Tuscan or something. And we'll catch you all on Thursday. Cheers.